Hey, welcome back to the Metropol Grid. My name is Andre, and my audio levels are probably not where they used to be. I recorded a video earlier this week, and turned out my audio levels were absolutely jacked up. Uh, they might still be, so let me know how that goes. How's everyone doing? It's a Thursday night. It is actually probably a slightly different time than it normally is. Uh, we had daylight savings time, I believe, this weekend, which is the one where you lose an hour. So that's the one that we all love so much. Uh, how's everyone doing? Yo, Yeti, how's it going? Catching the stream live for once up late in the UK. Yo, get some water before you get to bed, huh? Also, this music kind of slaps. That last song definitely slaps. I think, uh, yeah, River a &R, you you're calling out pretty well. That one's called The Bambino by Anthony Vega. I think it's one of my favorite ones I have on the playlist. It's really, really quite good. Hopefully you're doing well. Hey, Cold Lava, I was worried we jumped an hour forward in Canada and yet. I think not the whole world hasn't, right? Like, I feel like right now there is a difference between UTC and like Eastern Standard, let alone everything else. But I don't know, like, you don't get emails about this stuff. I, I feel like the nice people at Google should email you to be like, hey, just watch out. You're going to lose an hour. Ixaran, how's it going? Hopefully you're doing well. I thought of you um, when I was working again on my um, uh, agenda density calculator and I have a mode now so you can just like force it to do limited so you can do six point agenda suites and get some data from that, which I think is pretty useful. Hey, Kioro, Nato, how's it going from the other side of the planet? How's your Friday going? When do I get the math my body craves? It should be hopefully on Monday. Uh, I don't think we're gonna have a gameplay video up this week. I basically I've been continuing to work on the project and I've got a lot of other great features to it. I've been spending a lot more time on it than I uh, than I anticipated. And it's at the point where I'm really excited to show it off. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to separate the videos in which we potentially talk about what I think about 5.3 agendas in that future. And we're just going to do a video explaining the program, how to use it, and then going over some like uh, n interesting findings. Because I think there's a lot of findings that are super interesting and I think can really improve people's competitive Netrunner and deck building skills. So that should be on Monday, I'm hoping, maybe Tuesday. Hey, Casey Foster, how's it going? Welcome. Jamara, Kalana, how you doing? <laughs> so true. Actually, if we could just say forward forever, that would be great. Every year, we should go one hour forward. And I think it's going to be a super fascinating thing because then you have to get contacts when you'd be like, it was three o'clock, 1984. And then you'll know, you know. Uh, the name of the song was The Bambino by Anthony Vega. Vega, like Vega. Anthony, like Anthony Vega. Hey, Sauce, how's it going? It's 1.52 a.m. in Germany. They're here not used to catching the stream live. Jamar, is that earlier or later than normal? Because that is... I'm doing the math. Hold on. Six hours in the future. Six hours. That seems normal, though. That seems what it usually is. That's exciting. I crunched the numbers a good bit, but it looks like your tool is extremely thorough and I really want to test mixed one, two, three agenda suites more. Yeah, that's the big thing about the tool. It makes it so easy to to crunch uh, agenda suites that aren't just like, you know, all threes, all twos, stuff like that, which is easy in the hyper geometric. I've also can say confidently I've solved my math issues. Huge thank you to a whole bunch of people who have reached out to kind of give us the answer that we we're looking for last week. I'm not going to go too deep into it for those who don't care about the math, but I think a lot of people actually might be excited about the math. The difference was last week. The number that we were showing was the average number of accesses to win across all simulations. And we don't actually want that. What we needed to be showing is the cumulative probability attached to each number of unique accesses. So the idea is that on four axes, we have a really, really low percent chance of win. That'd be like basically if every four axes off the top of R&D was an agenda and we won. So then you want to keep getting that cumulative probability. So the probability of winning on five axes is how often you want on five axes plus how often you want on four axes. And then you want to keep doing that until that cumulative sum probability hits at least 50, which turns out to be exactly where the hypergeometric uh, puts it out to be. Uh, Ruben shouted out in the YouTube last week that we were actually not calculating the hypergeometric, but we we're calculating something called the negative hypergeometric, which is uh exactly what we were calculating i'll leave it at that because i don't know much more than that i had to look into it but the numbers are good and we got better data yet yeah that was not, yeah that wasn't exactly skew we were calculating something that was accurate but that was the point that we won but we wanted to find the point where our cumulative sum probability hit 50 which is just slightly before that uh yeah daylight savings corp click card one i'm pretty sure in the world of netrunner how's it going wyatt that daylight savings probably isn't a thing anymore i think a lot of people want to get rid of it I think those people are probably not farmers. I feel like farmers are probably underrepresented in the online community of discussions, not to like stigmatize farmers that they can't have the internet. It's just like not a, you know, not a subsect of society that I think a lot of people consider, myself included. 
Yeah, it's a negative higher geometric. I don't know what that is exactly. I, I Well, I did last week when I read into it, but it's not something we need to produce. We, we don't actually want it, so I can't really go further than that. But it's really cool, uh, and we'll have something out hopefully on Monday. And um, the numbers are really good. The numbers are really, really surprising. Like, some of the stuff is really obvious, but I think what we're going to be able to show on Monday is there's certain cards that you probably should be playing in every deck. There's certain cards you should definitely be playing in every single deck. And then, like, the value of negative agenda points, I think it's actually one of the most frightening things on the numbers. Um, and it's really cool, too, because, like, it's very easy for you to take your Thule deck and calculate, wait, how many accesses you need to win on th three negative agenda points versus two negative agenda points. And admittedly, the thing assumes that you take every negative agenda point you hit, which is not exactly accurate, specifically if you're working a bit harder with, like, Meridian or Hangeki. But like there is a chance, math willing, that Meridian could and should see play in standard uh, HP. Like there is a there's a big chance that the numbers suggest that Meridian should be just played everywhere <laughs> that it can. <laughs> like negative agenda points have a huge impact on the game, barring your agenda suite. If your agenda suite supports them, they're really, really good. So things like the Global Food Initiative agenda suite, where you already are winning on four axes no matter what, and a single negative point doesn't affect you, it doesn't matter. But on so many other agenda suites, it increases your number of axes to win by like three or four. Like absolutely buck wild stuff that I do think you should consider in just about anything. Thought I heard the farmer thing was a myth. I am going to go and continue on that myth. I don't actually know better. Um, I think it makes sense too, just so we line up a bit better with the daylight, but I imagine... I feel like every year we have this conversation, I don't learn anything about it. Hey, why in the hyper capitalist world of Netrunner, I know there is a time slash work shenanigans or <laughs> yeah, yeah, boomed. Hey, super not generally for farmers. Daylight savings is worse because it gives them less time to get to market. Whoa, that was a market thing. I thought it was just like wake up in the morning and have more sunlight to like do early farmer stuff. That's really cool. I'm so interested to see the difference between three, two, 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 ones and two, three, three twos and three two yes this is super easy to and i also added a mode where you can add three different things and you can do this triple comparison uh so you'll be able to graph it all together and it's really nice also hearing negative points are sick is sick because i love them i think people hate them and i think they're in vogue right now and i think people are accidentally discovering that they actually have a really sizable impact on the game because classically if you ask me like do i put my news teams into just about any agenda suite in nbn and i would say probably no but i'll be able to show you on monday again that the numbers actually kind of support this and admittedly, this there's always downsides to these cards. Our model only, you know, models them as if they were negative one agenda points, the runner has to steal, which isn't always the truth. I think news team is kind of always the truth. Uh, but yeah, no, they they turn out to have a huge impact on the game. So we'll see how that works. Whalen calling it crunch time. Sorry. Nightmare Sports is the best. I don't know if I like Nightmare Sports as much as like just Nightmare Nightmare. Just like Nightmare deck. Uh the sort of solo mirror deck is really kind of cool. Hey, Diogene, Padma plus Cassie string. Padma plus Cassie string is like it is the next best thing to Mad Dash and Mad Dash is incredibly powerful, especially if there's certain uh, like agenda suites you're expecting to play into competitively, which classically for the last year. Yeah, you are. Is it better or worse than Mad Dash? It's definitely worse than Mad Dash. Um, also, Daijin, there's you brought up. We've been talking for a bit on Slack about stuff, and I know that you brought up Padma and saying Padma maybe is worth playing. And then I think you give a long list of like all the Padma cards, like oh, you can it works with this and this and this and this and this. I didn't write this in Slack, but in short, what I think is that's correct. But the problem with Padma is you only charge one card, so it doesn't matter if you have like nine good charge targets. All you need is really one good charge target, and you kind of get there. So, uh, is Cassie String better than like Wake? Maybe, probably not, but at least it's fun. Um, I'm actually unreasonably about this tool. Also, yeah, I think they're probably reasonably disliked minus agendas, although I think they're in a much cooler place than playing to six. Unreasonably excited. Yeah, yeah. We'll be able to look at the math, but it's really cool. Speaking about excited, this is a Doomrad deck. I think Doomrad got the deck list of the week, maybe two weeks ago with the PE deck, which is pretty cool. I adore you doing the work, even as a deeply casual player. I love this competitive analysis. It's really cool, right? Like, I'm not strictly a competitive player. I haven't played competitive Netrunner in a really long time i've kind of just pulled myself out of that for better or for worse but uh understanding the data will make you in some ways a better deck builder in some ways a better player and just having a basic idea of what you can do to your agenda suite will make you go it's, it's like building a bad agenda suite or like an indefensible agenda suite which is largely what the thing that we're trying to build proves um has a huge impact on your games it, ju it just can have a huge impact like changing the number of how many accesses to win slightly by two or three is a world of difference for your corp deck if you're just trying to do your thing is there word on the next cycle release? Yeah, uh, end of June. That's currently uh, what's been said. Hey, Phil, smoking. Yeah, we're, we're blazing it today. This is Jet Cheetah. This is Doom Red's deck. This is a smoke deck. The big question is, is Shaper dead after the last ban list rotation? Of course, Endurance is out, and then Cabanessa Wu is out. So that is basically 
uh, every deck was affected by that. And then Shaper was affected probably the most because it's not very common that uh, there's hardware or sorry, consoles that Shaper is excited to play. And Endurance was definitely one of those. Uh, so the question is, which shapers can play the game that are now World Tree Woo? Because World Tree got, sorry, Woo got banned, not World Tree got banned. And then which is a shaper that doesn't rely on endurance? If you ask me, is shaper entirely dead? I've done very little to no testing, so I couldn't tell you. But I do think Smoke was one of the main candidates. Smoke was actually one of the last competitive shaper decks over the last year to eventually play endurance. There were a lot of stalwarts and smoke is its like own breed. Uh, there are smoke players that have just been smoke players uh, uniquely for like the last, I don't know, since smoke has come out. What's the number on this? 2016. Wow. So it's been a while. So like I think the name Odal shows up a fair bit. But these are players who will play smoke within and outside of every meta. And smoke is actually, I think, a fair bit more interesting than a lot of players might think. In short, you get one credit to be used for icebreakers every turn. That's a fine ability. It's an economic ability. It's the sort of ec economic ability that just lets you do things. It doesn't mean it has to be your game plan. Just a credit a turn is for immediately for icebreakers. It's fine. It's not bad. 40 card minimum. That's classically been a good thing, right? In competitive card games. But the big thing is this is a stealth subtype. And if you're not familiar with this, because this doesn't exist currently in startup, is that there are certain cards. And this was a theme that went all the way back to original uh, Netrunner back in 1995, 96, is that there were certain icebreakers that were hyper efficient, but they required stealth credits. So these were technically viabilities unless you had the engine to support them. And currently this deck is only running a single stealth breaker, which is pretty buck wild. It's just after image and after image has been for a long time, the best stealth breaker, but we've seen stealth breakers across every single subtype of ice, uh, barrier sub ice stealth breakers, code gates and, and sentries. And generally code gates and sentries have been the best um, by a mile after image is really, really good. It allows you to bypass ice and then on its own, it's just a good enough breaker if you actually have to break ice. And then that's it because the idea is the 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 shaper prison hell that exists right now it can still use buzzsaw and cleaver which are mind you not stealth breakers mind you can still use the credit from smoke and then just play two turbines and you're kind of off to the races i think this is interesting because it kind of embraces one of the issues a lot of players run into when they try and build a stealth rig where it's very very easy for somebody to be like okay i'm playing stealth so i'm gonna play after image and then i'm also gonna play uh what's the name of the the code penrose and then i'm also gonna play like some bad stealth fractor that probably doesn't exist anymore but for what it's worth, if your whole deck is hamstrung by a limited resource, mind you, stealth credits, of which you only have access to so many each turn, it's probably in your best interest not to go all in on stealth. Use stealth only where it's the most important, the most valuable, and then for everything else, get away with whatever you can get away with with not stealth. And this deck is definitely doing it a bit further than I'm used to. Usually you'll run Penrose because it's sometimes a fractor, but it is a very good decoder, and then you will be using just about always after image. The killers have been really, really good classically. Um, but yeah, we're kind of pulling off of that. We're just only running after image, which is good. And mind you, we saw the necklace last week with all the centuries in, in um, Jinteki. You could bypass one of them, um, but this does break everything really cheaply, specifically also if you're using the turbine. And this actually doesn't need stealth credits if you're already at four strength, which is fantastic. Watching your videos have improved my understanding has made me want to jump on JNet when I was intimidated before. Yay, yeah, super not. That's super cool to hear. Um, I promise you, playing this game with like strangers, firstly, if you can do it in person, that's kind of always like the best thing to do. But like if you're not involved in the green level clearance discord, I would highly recommend to get in on there. There's rooms for either newer players or people who are new to Jinteki.net. You can flag at mentor and then someone will show up and be like, hey, I'll teach you how to play on Jinteki.net. And people there are so excited to have new players, let alone they're incredibly patient, incredibly helpful. The Neverner community is by like by a mile, the best card game community I've ever seen. It's I don't think anyone would disagree with that. So if you're not there, I'd recommend you to get in there because if you just need to get over that wall of getting familiar with Jinteki.net, um, there are so many people there that would helpfully like, you know, that move where you kind of put your back up and then you put your hands on your knees and they kind of you climb them that they'll do that for you. It'll be great. Um, but do check it out. Just remembering a weird dream where we got stealth charge, huh? <laughs> Sophie, how's it going? Oh yeah, charge. Oh, it's a mechanic that people are using right now, huh? We'll see how that goes. Sorry, this is off topic. Free play to ignore, but is it an established color pie corpse and runners? Narendil, totally there's an established color pie in Netrunner. It goes all the way back to the original designs. There's a really cool video you can find on YouTube of the original Android Netrunner. And mind you, Netrunner was a reboot of a 1996 game. But when they rebooted it to Android Netrunner, uh, Lucas Litzinger actually made a video talking about the color pie. And since then, I think even just playing startup, you can get some basic ideas about the color pie. Uh, classically, criminals have information. They have bypassed. They get paid to run. Stuff like that is pretty common. Uh, it 
classically, HQ pressure has been a criminal thing. R&D pressure has been a shaper thing and archives pressure has been an anarchist thing. That's actually kind of been spread a bit more. So now criminal, criminal in theory is just about central pressure and, and it makes them a lot more flexible. I think the difference between Zaya and Gabriel Santiago, uh, shaper in short, they have ability to pull things at instant speed. They have the ability to tutor cards from their deck. They have generally the most efficient answers to problems, but they're generally pretty unique and specific. So it's like, you know, uh, threading the needle as opposed to just hitting with a giant hammer. Um, I think Anarchs are closer to the hammer. They're a bit more inconsistent. They don't do anything in moderation. They don't have any generally tutor abilities. They have to trash their own cards. They're disruptive to trashing their own cards and the runner cards. Um, and Corpse Side, we could go on for a while too, but when we get to there, I guess we will get to there. But yeah, there's a very well-established color pie. And I think the easiest way you can tell that is by looking at how you spend influence. Because 90% of the time, the way that you spend influence in Netrunner, at least at the meta, is like a bit interesting, is that you're using the tools of influence to pull in things from outside the color pie that you don't have, right? So classically, uh, every basic faction and runner faction are meant to be best at breaking a certain kind of ice. So criminals are meant to be best at breaking uh, sentries. We got a sentry here from criminal. There is an established color pie, but honestly, the color pie is dead. I don't think the color pie is dead. I think certain parts are wider and certain parts are more narrow, but I think it's interesting. I like to call that breaker set the break one, get one free package. Wait, Thanos, which one? How's it going, by the way? The stealth is a red herring. It's just the Tau's ability is meaningless while the turbine already invalidates size. Yo, Sads, you might be entirely right. Like, there's just a chance that this text here, one credit a turn, is good enough. And you could probably play this deck with no stealth. Besides, of course, it's only a single net Mercur. Oh, we've kind of lost the plot here, haven't we? We've totally lost the plot here. This is like the card, the reason why you'd want to play a smoke deck. Because this takes your one credit a turn and allows it to be translated after you get value from it to net Mercur. So you can make your ability a free card draw a turn, let alone you can just put the credit here, it becomes two credits a turn, and then you can use those credits at any point in the game to do anything. Uh, the text for anything is a really funny sentence, uh, let alone these are also stealth credits because the stealth subtype. Um, but yeah, it clearly doesn't seem to be important for a deck considering we're only running a single net Mercur and we're not even running any other stealth cards like mantles and stuff you expect. I didn't even realize that. Oh, that's kind of ugly, isn't it? Yikes. Even though there's a rigid color pie, the clash between FFG and SG would kind of ruin it. Yes, there is division between the two, but I do think there's a lot of fundamentals you can still see between the two. All those breakers are pay one credit for break two. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I generally call them the fixed strength breakers as much as that's not accurate, but it kind of gets you there to like 2012 F Netrunners, if people know. I play basically this one, Parhelion Drop. You get weirdly broke playing this out of Tau because install runner setup. Interesting. Personally, I think we're at a place where there's a handful of effects you can only see in one color runner side, but no real color pie. Yeah, so for instance, like Expose, there used to be an Android Netrunner uh, 2012 FFG stuff. There used to be Neutral Expose. There's no longer Neutral Expose. And I'd be surprised, admittedly, this, this hasn't been an NSG thing, to see Expose in any faction that's not blue. Um, as little as uh, impact Expose has on standard, let alone there's none in startup. I, it, those are the sort of things that I, I think. There are certain things that are still pretty sacred when it comes to uh, the color pie. I feel weird that this is my first smoke deck. It's obviously, I feel weird that this is my first smoke deck. It is obvious to me that K2CP by breaks the design. Yeah, so K2CP Turbine is like kind of, I, I always struggle to find the gender, neuter, gender neutral term for the boogeyman, but it is that sort of card. It's the sort of card that people are really afraid of because if this card does become good, it's going to be an issue. Oh, Deuce is Wild, you're right. But Deuce is Wild is only ice. But yeah, yeah, no, Deuce is Wild is the only neutral exposed in the game. I'm going to say without thinking well about it. Alvin, how's it going? This is just monstrous. Um, specifically, the way that it pairs with these breakers that are really, really good, besides the strength issue, this solves them. It's also not unique. In theory, you could play two, but I don't think you really ever want to. Um, uh, but the idea is that if you get to the mid game and you're trying to play Netrunner where your ice is trying to tax out somebody, you just can't do it with this engine. Uh, you just can't do it with this exist. Uh, this, um, uh, effect and I feel like this card is going to kind of ricochet between being common and playable and being not played at all at least in the competitive scene because if the decks are just going fast enough where like you could struggle to get this together and I think in Shaper it's less of a problem where you have ways to tutor it as opposed to like Anarchs or Criminals playing one or two of these uh yeah it's just hard it's like if the game is about breaking ice as cheaply as possible usually it's not an exciting game and I feel like if this is very common it's going to have a big impact on the court meta more than maybe anything else because if you had an idea that some of your ice was going to be taxing, it's not going to be anymore. But barring the on res on an encounter, and there's even ways to deal with that. So I don't know. It's hard. It's hard. Seems to make Ice Carver sad. Yeah, Ren, how's it going? But Ice Carver has been sad for a really long time. Right? Like, 
this card is, do, uh, what's it called? Um, Turbine's immensely powerful, and I don't mind so much the idea of power creep if the card that has been crept upon is, um, uh, is or isn't under the curve. I think Ice Carver is definitely not great. I think Leech is just a better card overall as much as you need to put more effort into it. It generally works better with the run-based strategies, and if you can run cheap, why not? But yeah, nobody really plays this. And in Millie, this is a resource. It's unique, so there's some upsides and downsides to it, but like the fact that you can pull this at instant speed is kind of buck wild as much as one... In one influence, or sorry, one MU doesn't, I don't think really matter. How prevalent is program destruction in the current meta? Uh, Kim Lane, how's it going? In standard, very little to none. And that's because it's so easy for any shaper to play three copies of Simul Chip in their deck if they want to. We are not, but you could. And there's good reasons to do it. But with that, you don't only need program destruction, you need program destruction and you need an additional layer. Generally, you have to play cards like Arc Lockdown to be able to make sure that the breakers that you trash aren't just going to come back. And even with Arc Lockdown, you can play around it with Simul Chip. The worst problem is that the Anarchs, every single Anarch, basically in standard for the last five years, has been playing these breakers, which are breakers you can reinstall from the bin whenever they're in there when you're encountering the appropriate piece of ice. And there's one for each type of ice. So it's really, really hard and kind of really bad in standard to do program destruction. You have to run through a lot of obstacles to make it work. In startup, it's sick because startup program recursion is at a huge minimum and there's none of these tools. So it really depends on your format and startup program recursion is really good. Program destruction is only good if you're playing against criminal. That's kind of it. If you're playing against criminal, a lot of criminal decks are running one of every program. So if you trash it, it ain't coming back. And they do have other tricks like AIs and like bypass effects, boomerang, stuff like that. So you still doesn't win you the game on the spot, but it, it's a huge dent. So it's like if you're saying you're running into Shaper, you know, Anarch and Criminal one third of the time each, which I don't think is nearly true. Um, yeah, it only works one of the three to three times. Boogie creature. I like it. Raymond Flint. Nah, he's gone. He's gone. Happy Thursday album. Thank you to you too. Boogie man, boogie woman, <laughs> boogie woogie. Also, neutral cards don't really count factionless and all. Well, they should. I think the neutral cards, it's like notable when neutral cards do interesting things. Leech is counterplay to it, which really like purging icing centrals. Meanwhile, what's a counterplay to turbine? Just go fast. Ian, no, yeah, totally. Like there's no counterplay to turbine. It just really go fast or run ice like stuff like, you know, uh, uh, what's it called? Mesna Chesvo. Yeah, I'm, I'm confident. Mesna Chesvo, we like funhouse stuff like that. I don't know. Ginger gear check. You can go fast. That's all you have to do. But yeah, I feel like this is a card that if it ever becomes good and becomes commonly played, it probably will get banned. Uh, it, there's no way around it. It probably will get banned at some point if this becomes a, the common thing in the meta. If you're seeing this all the time, um, it, it's worse than Endurance. I honestly think this is much worse than Endurance. Like Endurance comes down and then you can actually have the counterplay around Endurance. Obviously, you don't need breakers, but when this comes down... How many subroutines do you have? It doesn't matter. Like, I don't know. I, I'd rather have endurance than this if this is common. So, yeah. Neutral cards don't count as mechanic appearing out of its faction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. It just, I, I was wrong about my exposed thing. World Tree got banned, but the thing in setup, the things its setups were untouched. Yeah, and the idea is like maybe the setup is clumsy enough. But I don't think a lot of people were pursuing the setup before the endurance ban because they didn't need to. So now we're going to see if pursuing it is the right thing to do. Uh, we're also playing Onicom, which is like fine. We have a 25 events. How bad can that be? I like Onicom. I don't mean to slight Onicom. Yeah, surprise 40 card shaper. All right. It's so upsetting that this is not really a stealth deck. Uh, L smoke. Hey, Lucas, I don't think it's worse that Endurance, since Turbine is so slow, they do different things, I think. Yes, Endurance gives you an immense amount of pressure and saves you a lot of uh, economic frustrations in the early to mid game while you are getting set up, right? So the question is, it's how soon can you put the Turbine down? And that's the question, right? Like, if Turbine can consistently come down on turn 8, can you play a Corp that wins on turn 16? I don't know. And again, if people are now, and the issue is like when ice gets bad, people generally pursue other win conditions. And right now, other win conditions are kind of all I'm seeing on JNet casual and admittedly, and it's not a tournament, but like JNet casual, where it's like, you know, it's assets or like damage or, you know, hard hit news, all the other stuff, because I don't know. I, I feel like that you have a shot on the first eight turns. Runner. When's the next meta defining event that provokes a ban list change? So that's actually a good segue. Um, we'll talk about this in the news, but accelerated meta test is such a good name. Um, there's going to be some regular events. The first one that Nelson is organizing, these will be free to enter. Um, the prize support is um, only an invitational. There's no physical prizes, but that will be actually next week on March 25th. 
on this channel, we're also organizing, um, whoa, did our game not work? We're going to be organizing a GNK, which is open to anyone. Uh, I put out a poll to uh, the nice patrons of this channel to figure out what time makes sense for them, but it's open to anyone. Uh, we are, it's, uh, we're going to have price support. I did buy a GNK for it. I'll be running another one after that, but if you stay tuned to this channel, we'll be able to tell you what date or time that's going to be locked down to relatively soon. Currently it looks like it's going to be on the first weekend of April, maybe on the Sunday. That's what's winning on the poll right now. Uh, yeah. What, what happened to our game? But yeah, no, uh, I don't think there's any, any big events, but you're going to see a lot of events popping up now because GNK kits and circuit opener kits are kind of showing up and people are applying to nationals, but that can be as like this summer. That's not anytime soon. Could the move towards 2, 1, and 3, 2 Corp agenda speeding up Corp be a factor in Turbine essentially speeding up runners? Is that just fast Netrunner now? Netrunner has been a lot faster in a lot of ways for a long time. Um... It's kind of an interesting discussion, though, because like I think a lot of people bring up pain points in Netrunner for the last little while that there's been some very hyper competitive corporations in which scoring agendas is actually not part of their game plan. And then there are some that scoring their the agendas as fast as possible as their game plan. It's generally one of the two extremes. Um, for what it's worth, all the three twos and two ones are not showing up that commonly in a lot of the competitive decks. Like the ones that are scoring out agendas besides sports metal are running like four twos and then like food. Um, and then the ones that are scoring out really slowly are just running all five threes. Ooh, SSO. Oh man, this one could be really difficult. This one really kind of checks us as how fast we can get into something. I feel like without endurance, SSO is a fair bit better. So the thing with SSO is that if they have an agenda face up installed, they get an immense amount of value because this allows you at the end of your turn to put advancements on an unadvanced card, or it has to be an ice, right? Yeah, an ice equal to the agenda cost of the card or the points of the card, right? So the idea is that they get a five, three on the table behind a single ice, they can triple advance it. And that actually can be really scary because some of the triple advanced face checks, things like Hordem or Mouseless are actually really quite bad. And so like face checking into it are awful. Now, one of the best things you can do in this matchup is make sure that you can run the remote server on turn one or on turn two to be able to steal the agenda so they're not snowballing value for the next two or three turns. Because this is inherently a very snowballing ability. If you can't dismantle it, then next turn they get another three event of three advancement counters and then another three advancement counters. And that's a ridiculous amount of value. So I'm not a big fan of SSO for that reason, as much as I liked playing SSO back in the day. The, the face of agenda suite, a fair few of them rotated. But like our biggest thing here is to make sure we get into remote server. And unfortunately, we're not on botulus, we're not on boom meringue we're not inside job so we are probably one of the fact factions barring like uh what's it called angolo and shaper that is going to be the worst at um charging the remote server the best we could do is like overclock with um what's it called with an uh, self-modifying code and also we can expose the iso deuces and that might may maybe we're able to face check into um certain things i played against sso for the first time since i started playing yesterday get out yeah sso got a fair bit worse because again the face of agenda is kind of rotated out oh it's a hostile right Okay, I have no idea what this is. I have literally no idea what this is. It looks like, um, what? It looks like an NGO front on top of an upgrade, maybe a wall to wall. That's three to trash. Let's just get some card and some credits. I think we just overclock this so we can trash it. We got two turbines. Yeah, I think we just overclock this. I don't know what this could be. Yeah, shell game, I don't know. It has to be ice, so I'm assuming this is just like an ugly start. So they can res that if it's an NGO front. It is, okay. So they spent two clicks and a credit to gain five, so it's not bad. And it's a forced connection. Okay, so they're trying to hurt us. So here they can do nine. Uh, they can do trace three, so they can do trace 12 for two tags. We can't clear the two tags. Well, we can clear the two tags. So here they don't really want to boost into it because we have five free credits to boost into this. So if they just financially ruin themselves, I think we're okay with it. Now, this means they're clearly trying to hurt us. So we have to watch out for hard hitting news and the like, but um, not what I was expecting. So this is going to cost us one credit. Oh, so, well, one actual credit. Okay, so we just want to keep our money up. I think we're worth checking central servers. There may be a snare here. I don't remember if they mulliganed or not. Transparency initiative. Okay, these are the sort of cards that you have to play to get your ability to be relevant. Uh, it allows you to install an agenda face up and not even install an agenda, but flip an agenda. So it's really bad. And then when you advance it, it becomes free, which is like really worse than most of the other face up agendas. Um, here, it's either we creative commission to feel safe or I'm going to value like 
we probably have enough money if we need a burst overclock. I just need to get into breakers because again, if they get something in the remote server transparency initiative, we have to get that as soon as possible. Uh, it might've been Saber to creative, but like we're not spending the money on the next couple of turns unless they like economic warfare into hard news us, which uh, I don't think they're going to recover from that financially either. Two turbines and smoke seems like a waste of slot. I think a big thing about it is like, how soon can you get there? Like how soon can you pull it together? But I agree. How's it going, by the way, that it might not be the right slot. It's just like, I don't think you want to SMC for this for six credits. So maybe you just have to naturally play it. Transparency initiative is a sad do nothing for click. Yeah, it's really bad, but it turns on SSO. So it kind of feels like a necessary evil. Back in the day, you used to be able to play a full agenda suite of only face up agendas. And unfortunately, a whole bunch of them rotated. So you can't do that anymore. So now like that really bad card is an issue. Oh, this is really good. So we're just going to become, um, for what it's worth, Quetzal is interesting, but Quetzal is actually not bad. It allows us to deal with um, uh, the five strength, uh, what are they called, Akets, really well. Uh, but I do think we can just cleaver through that for a credit, so we'll be fine. We'll just do Steve. The only one I can think of is Oaktown for our face-ups. There's a 5-3 called CityWorks Project, which to steal, you need to have a lot of agendas in hand. That one's really important because you do meat damage equal to advancements. So that one's really good. Um, I think we're going to take the deuces and the dirty. So next turn, we can do two overclocks if we ever get it down. But yeah, there used to be like a 3-1 that was not great. Two four twos, two five threes. There's a really good 5-3 that when you advance it, it advanced other cards. So it worked really, really well with SSO. Oh, wow. This is just absolutely going to be prison. It feels like they have so many disparate win conditions. It's going to be hard to tell which ones we have to respect. So we know in their hand they have that transparency. This might be a Rashida. I think that's the worst case. Oh, it's an urban. Okay, so they're just going to grind us down. That's ugly. This is another good reason why I like having just a way to run the remote server. We're also not running. Are we running pinhole? Because I feel like the strategy. Yeah, we have three. OK, so they have three. I don't think we care about this. We'll just pin pinhole it. Yeah, CityWorks is the only big one right now. They drew, they credited. So we're just going to keep drawing through a deck. We have three pinhole and 31. So once we pinhole that, we're in a good spot. They're not getting there. The fact that they physically advance this is actually really bad. Because the only time you can use SSO's ability is if the card doesn't have advancements on it. So that actually hurt them a fair bit, I think. All right, we have the Anacom. Um, So we could always like put the Anacom down, run HQ, get an access. Yeah. We have to create a last click. We're not going to get the Anacom trigger. Anacom draws you a card. So we'll go for these two. Anacom draws you a card after an event resolves or when it's trashed. Unfortunately, we've already played an event this turn. Three influence do nothing card. So it looks like it is kind of a prison. Uh, I still think we're going to play that. Just need to draw into pinhole. Yeah, that's right. We have a couple turns to do it. And even if this fires, it's not the end of the world. But um, we can also face check too, right? Like, what's the worst case? If it's an Ak Afshar, whatever. If it's a Hordem, whatever. It's a Mouseless, it's kind of ugly. But then they pay three credits for that. So I, I'm fine. I'm headed to bed. Uh, I adore all your work. Yeah, hey, Yeti. I appreciate it. Get some water before you go to bed, eh? <laughs> Thanks for dropping in. Seems like a kill deck with the ambushes and renewals. Yeah, it's just like, I don't... These are two disparate win conditions, right? Like, maybe force connection, but they'd also have to have boom or end the line. And for this, they'd also have, have to have, like, public trail into end the line. Like, none of them do it on their own. I just feel like these might be cards that say, like, are all kind of offensive. I just... I, I would be surprised to see both of these. Unless it's, like, an acid-based deck. I don't know. They also could be on like frighteningly few agendas. Okay, game might be an R&D if they're icing that up. HQ is kind of like worth icing up. We get some good value out of it immediately. Okay, there you go. So now we just force them to res everything, right? Uh, we can face check with this end. Let's force them to res on HQ. Hey, Izzy, how's it going? you're doing well i think i'm gonna do rnd first if they spend like at least three credits on this we can probably run server two uh we could probably draw for a pinhole here actually the single axis is not very good it's a forced connection this is a really weird card like this card sees almost no play but if you imagine this like a snare and anytime someone hits us you just pay four like you instinctively pay four this is trace seven for two tags like that's actually kind of good I, I i don't i don't know like this card is better than the amount of play it sees like, we just lost three credits on that. Admittedly, if it was a trashable, it's the same thing happens. But it feels like this is going to go through. Let's draw a pinhole. Okay, so we're going to first 
Oh, sh shit. I was going to draw first and then we could run this, but we need the money. So I think we're just going to get the money first and then we have to expose it and we can choose to run it. It's a mess in a chest, though. So if they res that, we can't get in. Oh, that's actually really ugly. I think we're just going to take the damage. Need some advice. Hey, Biscotta, would you rather run HQ or R&D early as a runner? Um, it, That is a very, very hard question. On turn one, HQ, because they have generally a, a one in five to have an agenda there. And getting information of what their hand is is usually equally important to R&D, but it's more likely to hit an agenda than like the random in R&D. But it depends if they mulligan. It depends on what the deck they're doing. If there's like cards you need to figure out, like are they on hard hitting news, stuff like that. I'm not sure this hand has enough turbines. All right, so this is going to go off. I think taking four meat damage is, is fine. I don't know how we lose to taking four meat damage. Like, none of these cards are important. We could always creative and draw, but then if we draw into a breaker and we lose the breaker, it's a huge issue because we only have one Ebsen of Simul Chip. Oh, we're going to draw anyways off of Deuces. Um, we can run HQ. Maybe if they res here. Well, they have to run anyways. Maybe if they res here, they can't do anything. Immediately if they res the mess in the chest, though, they can't do much else. Oh, we have too many cards. Is this an optional? I don't think... Oh, you may. No, we should have refused. We definitely should have refused. That was a mistake. Hey, Anders. Hey, man. Gone back to Neverland this week. Ordered the new Null Signal. You say sets and have watched like 20 videos of yours. How's it been so far? Okay, that's good. Okay, now we can lose the punitive. Um, I think we're just going to get as much money as we can. How's it been? How's it like getting to the game? I think startup right now is really, really, really great. And System Gateway is kind of the best uh, intro to the game product. Uh, thing we've ever seen so in theory we could lose the punitive because we stole the 5-3 but the fact that urban renewal cracked uh and then it hit an event from hand so we draw one from onicom is obviously pretty good as much as we have two overclocks and those are kind of duds with our hand but now we're gonna have no more turbines <laughs> we went from too many to not enough uh, we know that's a four strength code gate on server two so like we're just gonna have issues we're just gonna have huge issues breaking ice now that we've lost two turbines because we cannot deal with any of the big barriers or any of the big code gates um yeah we might have entirely mismanaged that early game. And I do think they're probably on very few agendas. So the amount of accesses we need, what's even our multi axis in this deck? Too deep dive. Oh, I hate that. You get back one with Steve eventually. Oh, that's a really good point. Yeah, yeah, no, we have to get one back one, Steve. You know, you're totally right. Yeah, we have no simul chips. Hey, CBS. Yeah, I totally forgot. Uh, at least with two of them. That's the reason you play two. So you can fish them back. But no, I don't think that's the reason why you play two. All right, so I don't think we put Fish it back first. Like, first we run HQ and they get two creative commissions. How many of the same events have we played turn after turn after turn? Right? I feel like we've played creative commission, the same creative commission, like three times. So in their hand, we know three of their cards. We know they're on the Bird Barbecue. We know they're on uh, Transparency Initiative. So running HQ is not a high value. I'm going to run R&D. Generally, if they have Advanceable Ice, when there's no advancements on them, it's the worst, the best time to do it. But in melee now, with a two ice remote server, Wait, this doesn't do anything. What is their deck? Uh, this is... This doesn't do anything? So I that's definitely a mistake of a res. But this is only cards in a server. Not on ice. And I think they might have just been discovering that right now. How do you play 1x each breaker no simul chip? I don't know. People are not playing program destruction. Oppo's deck is wild. Love this. Yeah, this is wild. Are they playing traps? I, I think there's a big chance that a lot of people might see this card and think it can advance ice. It's the sort of like breaker bay grid problem. Honestly, it seems amazing, but very changed. Stopping playing back in 2014, going to start a tournament in Copenhagen next month, and meta looks very interesting. Looking forward to it. Let us know how it goes. Um, is the F sort of deadly? No, we have two cards in hand. Yeah, yeah, they don't. This needs a card in a server, not installed in front of a server. Hi. Yeah, they can derez that if they want. You want to derez it? Wasn't as yet? Oh, excuse me, Alvin. No, it was, it was totally safe. Yeah, the game is definitely different than it was in 2014. <laughs> Learning a lesson. Uh, that's a good one. Uh, we do cleave through this relatively well. I don't want to go HQ as much as we could get value. Actually, we should, because I think we want to force them to res, because uh, just getting a creative commission back last click is four credits and a card draw. This seems worth it. Okay, there's the Aket. So this will get an advancement on something. 
Um, we break this for one credit at some point, but they're going to res us for two, and this advances another card. Now, this one can advance anything. It's just an installed card. So we know we need our cleaver to get through here. Uh, we know it's a mess and chest, so they're in five, so they can res us. So we just need to make sure we have breakers. This draws us four cards. That'll put us on six, so as long as we install something. Uh, counting to five, um, uh, to four, sometimes is tricky. Sometimes it can be hard. Um, we have SMC, so I don't think we need the Into the Depths, because we can just SMC overclock and it'll be good. Ketzel's looking good right now. You'd say that, but like still with Turbine Cleaver, we break this for one credit. Like it saves us one credit. Admittedly, we'd have to be set up and we need our cleaver anyways because we're a mess Fingo. So I think the value from Steve is going to be way bigger. Simulation reset for tempo. Off by one error, <laughs> classic programmer. Yeah, index starts at zero. They just did their whole hand. Okay, so we knew two of those cards and now they have an unknown HQ. If we don't draw into something uh, to get into there, um, that's fine. If they jam into server two, they can't res their mess in the chest though, so we're okay with that. Been looking at all your card and deck reviews for the format, it helps a lot. We'll be sure to drop a thank you, of course. Uh, blame you for any losses. No, yo, that's what we do. It uh, Definitely feel free. They just drew four more. So totally random hand is a bit of a scary thing to do um, in the middle of the turn. And really now that we're trying to threaten to get through Akkad. But again, if you're new to the game as well, like Anders, and obviously this goes to anyone, please ask questions. If we're playing live in the YouTube comments, like I answer everything. It usually takes me two to three days to get there, but like we'll have to answer questions. Hey, Sky, I'm so glad you're explaining things. I feel like this would be over my head if I tried to figure out myself. That's a really big deal right now. They definitely have agendas if they ice this up. Um, is like the jump from startup to standard is way easier than you might think it is. Because the majority of cards that get played are null signal cards, especially if you played startup like maybe a year ago. This is one of the real weird ones because we're in a real niche, strange part of the card pool that null signal games has done very little to support. And I don't think that's a problem. Uh, we're going to have to explain even more because they're cards that even I haven't seen in a long time, like this thing, um, let alone this thing. Okay, we need our breakers. We need to get to HQ. They have literally no economy and we're just not going to be able to pressure it. Like if we don't get our breakers down, Okay, that's good, right? Like, we can get this down. There is one advanceable ice that trashes stuff. So we could get down the cleaver, and we could, like, overclock HQ. It's not particularly good. I think installing this is actually probably pretty bad. I think here we run R&D. It was free. We could have done that early on a turn. If we overclock, we can trash stuff. I think we're just going to value overclock. This is really bad. It draws this card, actually. This is a mess. Don't do this. We're going to discard a card anyway. This cycles a card, so we're going to discard two cards. So this is really, really bad. I don't know what we're doing. I'm honest, I thought SSO rotated. Everyone did because SSO lost its ice suite. Um, so like functionally in a lot of people's minds, it did. We'll trash something here with the five credits, right? Like a miss, <laughs> like an ice. <laughs> oh, that was a really bad turn. I'm see yeah, okay. That's, uh, that's good. Can they res this? No. We're going to draw a card here. Okay, well... Hey, Shmendrick, how's it going? We're not playing Mad Dash. Not that we can Mad Dash that easily, but this is going to be a long game. Do you have a live schedule anywhere so it's easy to know when you're online? Anders is always the same time, Thursday nights, at uh, starting at 9.45 Eastern. 8.45 Eastern, he corrects himself. So it's just every Thursday, and then I put up videos whenever I have one. I've been trying to do every Monday. Greetings from the land of overpriced Wi-Fi. Orbs, how's it going? Where are you? Cards like SSO interest me because I like the more stranger niche cards. Hey, I'm with you too. I, I, I'm very fascinated by SSO. Is that a hoss? I don't know what that is. We can just pinhole thread to find out. It draws us a card. If it's an NGO, they pop it. If it's an agenda, they can't score it. Is there any advanceable trap we're worried about? No, it's an NGO front, probably. On a plane? You're watching the Metro Grid in the sky? What's in archives? So they shuffled back their urban renewal. So we don't get to see archives here. We just get to see the server two card. So if they don't res that, yeah, so that just cracks it. Uh, we still draw a card because of the pinhole threading. So we paid a credit to force the NGO. And by force, like, oh, this actually fails because there's nothing to access. We have a dirty laundry. I don't think we have to do that this turn, but I think we do. I think we just dirty laundry R&D to get the access to the wall we can. Uh, we can draw it once. Okay, well, that's our last one. It's just unfortunate to, you want to play one event a turn. Uh, at this point, we basically just need to get enough money to put our breakers down. Uh, we probably should be running HQ. They have nine credits, though. They can res just about anything. And we have to respect... That one's hard to break without the... Um, uh, this is a really big one. It's really hard to break this without uh, 
our engine. I'm really, we, it, we have not used our ability once. I think we should be running HQ. We just can't afford to do it without a breaker. So I think all we have to do here is take credits because we're basically going to have to slam down uh, eight credits worth of breakers and then still have some more money to run. Orbital, I'm also on a plane that we just landed. You, well, you both, you are on the same plane. Do you guys know that? Okay, this is something we weren't prepared for. This is a CityWorks project that's coming down. So if we want to steal this, it's for me damage. Unfortunately, because we have no simul chips, we can't afford to do that with this hand. Now, the issue is it's kind of up on our opponents to like drag this game out because now every turn they're getting three free advancements a turn. That's a lot of money. That's an absurd amount of advancements. Now, if we run through the Odoroshi, we can't. So now this is relevant. So it's in their best interest to hold us as prisoners into this game until we're able to steal this. So it's our best interest to like kind of click for four credits here. Um, we could draw into, we have one creative commission. We have two dirty laundries. We have a fair bit of economy that like we can just, yeah, we can just play this on archives. It draws a card, gains us three, but like we can't run and lose this hand. Smoke credit worth it. Yeah. Um, okay. They threw out, okay. Do did what? They did throw out the transparency initiative and they have a Winchester, which I would have been surprised to see. So if they score this out, I think we're happy. We're totally happy if they score it out. If they don't score it out, that's when we're kind of in, 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 in prison. Uh, so we're just going to play all our breakers slowly, and we have to run HQ to go get our, uh, our turbine. Good old Minneapolis. I take it you're coming, you're going. Yeah, you see, this is where they're just going to put this in remote and just camp. And immediately, though, here, they run out of value. If they can't install another ice, they can only advance this card, because this is only advanced as a card that isn't currently advanced. So they can't, like, make their Aket good, which, again, why I think single advancing the Mesa Chest, well, to some extent, single advancing the Aket is probably wrong, as much as the Aket advanced itself. So what are you going to do? Okay, three more advancements. We know that they have a Pharos, which they could res for seven. Um, that actually becomes, actually now it's a 10 strength, so we can't cleave it. At least if it's on archives, we're happy. But now, like, we don't do anything. And ideally, we don't do anything at the same speed they do. Like, the right thing here is probably just click three. They didn't advance this ice, which is interesting. Maybe it's an Afshar. But, like, I don't think we have to do anything anytime fast. This is also such a problem is that if we were a Mad Dash deck, we just install all the breakers, Mad Dashes, and we win. Right? Okay, barring border control, but they're both advanced cards, so they can't be border control. Oh, defensive upgrade. Okay. And now we're just going to play full control prison, which I told you, like, this is a snowball deck. If we cannot contest this, the game is absolute hell, <laughs> right? Like now they're getting three advancements a turn. Again, I don't like the design of this one at all. Um, it's kind of feast or famine. Because if we can just camp the remote server, their ability does nothing. Last gasp of smoke? I don't know. Uh, as much as this is barely a smoke deck, this is the deck list of the week, but it has like one stealth card in it. One Nemecur, one after image. Just a 40 card minimum is good enough, huh? All right, so we can run R&D. Immediately we can bypass this for one credit. That's pretty good. Let's draw once for an event. SMC actually gets us nothing of value. There are no more programs in the deck we want to get. Uh, we lost a misdirection, but here we just run R&D for one credit, I think. Um, we know this is probably a really big one. At least it's expensive for them to res. We hit a snare on R&D. That's kind of scary, but I think we just install our breakers and just click credits. Like They're not doing anything. We literally don't have to do anything either. But we could be running our R&D for a credit a turn. We probably should be. We almost definitely should be. Because we bypass this for one stealth credit, which is one smoke and then one real stealth credit. Second remote server. Whoa. That's cool. You don't see that often. So now how bad is it to face check and die? So we know they have a mouse list. That's probably that, actually. Play against the deck with a reg null deck, your favorite. Oh, that deck? This one? I don't know why anyone played Null now that we have Turbine. It's pretty absurd. It costs two to bypass, though? Yeah, but we have one on smoke, so it only costs us one real credit. Neurospike time. Oh, Sangrin, you're right. I, oh, shit, I totally forgot. Neurospike is probably what the deck is doing. And that's a Malapert, which means next turn they'd have to do double Neurospike. So we have to contest the Rashida. Oh, thank you. I totally forgot that Neurospike is a thing. Like, we probably wanted pinhole threading down the upgrade, as, like, twisted as that is. Or we can run R&D and win. Man, I just want a conduit. Why are people not playing conduit? Why do we have to only play deep dive? 12 cards left. What can we draw into? Um, run events. One dirty laundry. One sure gamble. Okay. Yeah, we could die, actually. We could get a Neurospike. Uh, Neurospike is a card that says if they've scored an agenda the corp, they can do three damage to us if they score three. So that's one credit here, one there. We steal an agenda here, we just run the remotes over here.
Uh, it could be a defensive upgrade, but it's more likely a Malibur. Oh. Oh. Look at that. You're right. I can't do that. <laughs> so we could... Oh, it's actually... No, no, yeah, I can't, I can't, I can't. No, but you're right. Is there a link to the deck you're using? It's on the front page of NetrunDB, Sky. So if you just go to NetrunDB.com, it'll reach you right there. Yeah, we need two stealths. So I totally forgot about that. That obviously makes a lot of sense, but this deck has so limited stealth access that that's going to be a problem. Now, we can always get this to five strength, but in fact, we can't. We can only get to four strength. So what the heck do we do here? Like, was the right play to play Turbine on turn one? The right play was probably don't get hit by uh, Urban Renewal. So what can we hit? If we hit a, a Pharaoh, like this could in theory be a seven strength uh, thinking. So this could be a seven strength. No. Yeah, a seven strength. Um, what's a Colossus? If it's a seven strength Colossus, we lose a breaker. If we lose a breaker, do we lose the game? Yeah. So like, can we literally not face check until we get another stealth credit? Yeah, kind of. Like, what are we doing? We could also just pay three credits. But the three advancements is something we don't want to give them. Like, what? what? Get the turbine from HQ? Yeah, probably. But then this could be the Colossus. Like, we can hit a Colossus right here. And if we hit a Colossus, it's really quite bad. Like, it loses the game. Overclock HQ? No, there's no real reason to overclock. Well, the fact that it was a four strength now feels like there's a reason. But we already hit our uh, Onicom. So maybe. Pray there's not Colossus. Yeah, we just have to kind of pray here. Immediately they're on seven credits, so if they want to advance, advance. Yeah, we can't die this turn. I don't think they have enough money. If Server 3 is Rashida, though, it's a problem. Yeah, in theory, if it's a Pharos, I think we're fine with it. We just clear the tag. Like, whatever. They spent seven on it. But yeah, we'll break all of it. Again, the Hordum gets really good subroutines when it's advanced. Uh, but we break it the same either way if we want to. But this is like absurdly good subroutines. Like this is the one that you really can't face check into, especially if they're a combo deck, which it looks like they are. And this one we break for one. Again, the fact that they single advance the Yuket actually makes it really ugly because it would have been five strength and we can only break one subroutine, which is very, very good if they have a city works in their remote server. We have to watch a watch out. If this is an Yuket, like suddenly this has sometimes four advancements on it and it's a totally different game. Oh, we disconnected. Oh, sh shit. Excuse me. Uh, rejoin. Rejoin? All right, we're back. Our hand is splayed out in a way that I would have never seen before. Yeah, I lose connection to, I think, a fair bit more when I play in the afternoon than in the evening. I wonder if it's the connection you lose to the JNet server or is the connection you lose to your opponent? Because I reckon in the afternoon, I'm more likely to play people from Europe, considering the time zone. I guess two turbines? That still puts us at four strength, which is not enough for the Odoroshi. But we can... Do we win? Okay, thinking. Okay, so we know what we need for the remote server. We know exactly what this ice is. So we know this one is a mess in the chest vote. So we have to get through a Pharos. How hard is that? We also have to not get punitive here, which is probable. Um, very likely. It's actually very hard to get punitive with Anakam, as long as you keep an event in hand. Uh, so obviously defensive upgrade, but maybe it's just a Malapert. Uh, I think actually we saw them play like Force Connection, so we maybe are able to write this off. Uh, if that is a Rashida, it's in a bad spot. But I think here it might be right just to click for credit and then throw out like two SMCs, I guess. Yeah. I don't think they have the money to do anything. Okay, luckily that's not a Rashida. I don't know what server three is. But they don't have a robust economy. Just making them spend credits is probably pretty valuable. 
maybe there's a chance that's an NGO friend, but like, oh, it is a Malapur. So they can do advance, advance. So this is the card that we were fearing because this means when they score the CityWorks project at instant speed, they can go get a card from their deck, which Neurospike is a card that says if you score an agenda this turn, you can do three net damage. Um, punitive doesn't work here. I think if they score this out, we're like super happy with it, but they have to score it out because they understand now if they leave an agenda in the remote server, they lose. And this is also like the huge issue with the narrative of SSO industry. Like as soon as you're on game point, your ability becomes such a high risk because I know both of the sizes. If I can get in there, we win. So how are you going to fire SSO anymore? Not that they haven't got enough value maybe so far, but you know what I mean? But here, the worst they can do is three damage. Immediately, if it hits a turbine, we just have to run and go get it back. But um, I think we're pretty happy with that. They're leaving it. Okay. <laughs> so we have to figure out what we need to run this. So to run this thing, we need to take five, uh, two meat damage plus five more meat damage. So we have to take seven meat damage uh, to access this card, not to steal it, to access it. So that has to happen first. Um, not that it matters. So the question is, if we do draw, draw, can we just run that? I think we might be able to. Hey, JTF, how's it going? So how much is this to break? Um, if we play the turbine, we can do always draw, draw, turbine. Uh, then we'll be on six cards, so that's not enough. We know this is not going to give an advance with the Akat. We know this is a mess to chess flow. I think even if we get them to res the message chest, we're happy because next turn they can do credit score, neurospike, neurospike. So like if we don't do something here, we actually can lose. The question is how expensive is this? So we can always draw, draw, draw overclock. Another line is just to trash the Malapert with um, pinhole threading, which actually probably is fine for us as well. So we just have to do the math. So to break a 10 strength Pharos, it's going to cost. I don't think we can do that gonna cost uh four fifteen and then to break this it costs twenty two credits Anacom saves you I don't think so because Anacom fires after the thing is trashed so like we need the cards up front right like we're not gonna draw from the uh, from the overclock until after the run which would mean we already access this which means we die so uh, Onicom triggers after, because the event gets played into like a limbo space on the table, and then it gets trashed when the event is done resolving. So if I'm not missing something, we don't actually draw. Oh, from Neurospike. Oh, from Neurospike, it, yeah, you're right. It saves us like half the time. In fact, there's no way we can die to Neurospike with a sand. I think we're, I think we're okay with this. Uh, yeah, you're totally right. Hmm. I do think there's an in interesting idea whether we want to, uh, I think we could just draw and get the turbine down. Why not deep dive? It's going to be really expensive. Because we actually can't break the Odoroshi. So like we have to get the turbine down, which means if we get the turbine down, we can't deep dive because we have no way breaking the Odoroshi. Oh, wait, we could pay three. Eh. Eh, not the worst, actually. Yeah, maybe not the worst. I'm pretty sure this is a mouse list, though. So like we really have incentives to get the turbine down. I don't think we're in a rush. This draws us a lot. OK, too much even. All right, just like that. So we can't die to Neurospike. It's it's impossible. They can't afford three of them, but in theory, they could triple Neurospike us. But they can't afford it. And now we're set up. Yeah, we'll be okay. This card's actually really important. Um, it's only a one of in the deck, unfortunately, but this card allows you to draw clicklessly during a run, which is really nice. Like you just boost your breaker and then, ooh, you have a card draw, which is sick. So we have one more deep dive in six cards. So even if we lose this one, eventually we'll just draw up and have another one. So here they might score that out and try. Yeah, they're going to score it out first click. They actually can score this out on start a turn. You can paint ability window there, which is really wild um, before uh, your mandatory draw. And then they're going to hit us with a neuro spike. But again, if we take an instance of three net damage, we'll end up drawing here. So we'll have another three cards in hand. So they have to triple neuro spike us, but they just don't have the money to do it. We'll see what they pull with this. It's their option. What in the heck is going on? APIS Keeper Isabel, when your turn begins, you may remove an advancement token from installed card to gain three credits. Okay, that's to influence. This card I have never seen on a table. Um, it's actually, this is technically is an ability that it works well with. We don't know what that is. It's not a face of agenda, but mind you, some of their agendas they have to play are face down. We obviously know that. It's a B deck, kind of looks like it. 
You want to score after drawing? Uh, usually, yeah. But there are some reasons, especially in, in what's it called, in uh, Jinteki, to want to to score before start a turn. Because you can, like, score a hybrid release and then get a start a turn trigger. Yeah, Sanjay would be really proud. I think a whole bunch of B folks would be proud. So this looks like an NGO front. I don't think we care what server 2 is. Uh, I think we just run. Like, I think they're going to have 8 credits because we're assuming this to be an NGO. So I think here, I think we just set up the pinhole. So this is one real stealth credit. So let's run the most unknown ice that we can. Viz, hey dear, how's it going? So let's see if they res again. They could pop this. Looks like an NGO front. Uh, that would be the third I think we've seen so far. Oh, it's Miss Vingo. Okay, Miss Vingo is actually really good for us. They're technically on zero credits, but this looks like it's five. Uh, so this we break for two. That puts us at five, thinking. Technically, we break this for free. Um, the question is if we use our stealth credit. We, uh, we're not expecting a lot of sentries at less than five cost. So six cost is a real big break point. So I think, I think here we can just break with Buzzsaw regardless. Uh, we have to do the math though. Like, what does it cost to break this? This costs one credit. This costs one credit. So, yeah, I'm pretty sure we just deep dive this turn. Uh, what are we doing? This one. So we use the stealth credit from here, which puts it on Nemerker. We'll put a credit there, and then we'll use a non-stealth credit for what it's worth because we have to break the Otoroshi. So we'll just use that out of pocket. And this is the first time you spend each run. So it's a free credit to run, right? We can also run HQ next and then pull back some sort of run event. I click on their HQ so we can pull back like dirty laundry. Do we don't have any? Do we have any way to make value and run at the same time? Yeah, we dirty laundry. So then we'll run HQ. And this is like, you know, it immediately took us some turns. Not that they're going very fast. Uh, but now all their ice gets broken for like credits, barring obviously the Pharos, which is good. So here we can use the stealth credit off Nemerker and get back. Yeah, right. That's just free, right? Like this is literally is free to break. Isn't that wild? Like that's the power of Nemecur. Free credit per run, let alone it translates the credit from smoke. The card's really good. I'm surprised there's only a one of in the deck, but I'm not an expert, as you saw me play uh smoke today. So they've three cards in here. We're assuming their agenda density is pretty low. Probably seven and forty nine. There's a chance they're on eight if they're on two ones, which the hostile takeovers make a lot of sense with this deck. Uh, considering it's hard for them to get to game point. Okay, so here we need to make a run. Um, two cards from the heap. We'll just take some dirty laundries. We could also take like something a bit more impactful, like a hedge fund. Uh, but we have to make runs here. Now, technically, we have like seven credits to make a run R and D. This could be a border control. It's a Rashida. I don't think we'd care to trash a Rashida. Uh, because we're trying to win right here. So if we dirty laundry R and D. They could pop this res a border control. If they do that, I think we're fine. This also draws us a card, but as long as we have two credits left over and we can always use the Netmarker credits. Okay. So this one we can bypass, but it's just expensive to not bypass it. It's actually, no, we can't bypass it. We have to break it. So we'll match strength. That has to be a stealth credit. And then we can break with a real credit. Right? Yeah. So then we'll have seven plus this. We can use this money to pay the deep dive, and then we should be in. It's an assassin. Whoa, I haven't seen this one in a long time. I always forget that this is a legal card. This is from Data Destiny. This used to be a really good ice. This used to be like a very terrifying ice. The game has kind of changed. Uh, the ice got a way more impactful than this. As really, this is probably still fine, as long as you're not running to linked runners. All right, we'll just deep dive. So we see a bunch of cards, and we get to pick one. A lot of agendas still in there. Send a message. Hostile architecture. Government subsidy. The deck is doing a lot of different stuff. So we'll steal the 5-3. Good game. We saw six points there, right? And that is our breaker suite. And now at this point, how cheaply are we running, right? Like, Miss Vingo admittedly seems to be really good. We do scale through it relatively well with Cleaver. Uh, it's a fair bit better than Paperclip. Uh, this one is... Annoying, but like most of the sites we break for one or two credits now. And so the idea is that we can just hammer central server. So I think a big thing is just how quickly can we set this up? The first neuro auto hit an event. The first neuro, like a neuro spike. 
I think I used to be a fair bit more popular when Neurospike kind of came out. So like I would never saw that much play. I know Whiteblade was playing a Neurospike deck. That was an SSO deck back in the day um, that he won some events with. And I think it's relatively good, uh, but it, it does, runs a different ice suite. Like they were running a lot of different packages in here. Like we saw a forced connection, but I don't think we saw any tag punishment. I forgot what we saw off the deep dive, but um, there's a lot. Like there's the Isobel too, which is also like, you know, particularly slow and not exactly the rush combo, but I wonder if they just want to play Glacier. I'm like really surprised at how unstealthy this stealth deck is. Like obviously stealth is really good. Um, it's just, we're not seeing any of the, the engine of it. We have like the bare minimum. It's basically like smoke is just an additional side effect. And we're just playing a 40 card minimum deck because I was just so surprised that after image, we actually can't use it functionally unless we get down our one of Netmarker or we find our two of K2CP Turbine, which I'm not excited to install early. Maybe that's on me. Some of these decks also classically had Peace in Our Time. I think that's called out in the write-up, right? But like Peace in Our Time used to be one of the quintessential like smoke cards because smoke had a lot of set up and then her engine only really works as soon as you start running. So immediately you're giving the corp clickless five credits, which, you know, you're never excited about that. But um, at least this gives you nine credits for a single card, which means you can basically set up your whole board state and go from that. How do you know this YouTuber's Canadian? Catch your own day. Eh? Yeah, that's nice. What an interesting card. This one? This was really cool. This card is actually very notable because it was one of the few cards that uh, was the easiest way for you to lose a Netrunner game. And that's because so many people forgot this turn, this clause, and you can't fix it. Like, I'm not saying this to scare people out of playing competitive or like organized play Netrunner because like this happens in like the very marginal cases on top tables on cameras. But like as soon as somebody messes this up and gets an axis, it's so hard to fix. There's no rewind for that. So this card was a lot of time people called it like game loss in our time. Um, it's, this card's good. It, it's actually really, really, really wild what it does. And if you have a deck that just needs as much money as possible, this is like the one card that you would al always see in like these in uninteractive combo decks that don't really exist modernly. Game lost in our time, yeah, or, you know. When you're that good, you optimize the deck for the least dead cards, skill more than consistency in the deck. JTFQ, in terms of what exactly? Game lost in our time, yeah. Y'all know, I've definitely tried. I've been like stuck on JNet trying to hit the run button and be like, why isn't it working? And I can't figure it out. Um, It's because of that. Okay. Um. 1x never occur. Oh, why they're playing it? The thing is, like, Nemaker is such a flexible card, right? Like, Nemaker gives you the ability to, like, you know, run archives for value. Because as soon as you're able to translate, and I know you know this, right? But as soon as you're able to translate your credit from Smoke into, like, a free card draw or, like, just a free credit, it's like, you know, Desperado, it's Penny Shaver. It's such a flexible and useful card. So, like, as long as you're running consistently, this seems really, really good to me. It does seem really good to me. And I think the fact that our Breaker Suite is, like, largely not... This part is not usable, let alone our whole breaker suite is actually relatively bad until we get a turbine up. Uh, we don't sweat the small stuff, but um, I don't know. I was just surprised to see that. I don't think this deck needs a mantle because you're totally right. Like a, a single turbine is better than the mantle um, for sure. I'm just kind of caught me off guard for sure. Uh, but that being said, like this is not a card you can tutor, right? Like it's so much easier for you to say, I'm going to play one turbine because I'm going to be able to overclock it with my self-modifying code. But like there's no way to tutor the never Kirk. And Nemrakur also, like, for such a fundamental card that seems like the core to any smoke deck, a lot of players very quickly on in the tuning of, like, uh, smoke from, like, five years ago went from three to two. And some people went from two to one, but I don't know. It's my favorite card when I'm playing smokes, so I think that's probably more why I want it, just because it's a fun card. It gives you the most, like, decision points uh, and more control over the game, which I like, as much as it might not be necessary. Okay, we're going to do some news before we're going to get into some deck building. This is a really cool one. This is by Jeff uh, Ysengren, you might know. Even though more in-person events are occurring, the last few years showed us that online events should continue to receive support. So starting this March, that's Saturday, if I'm not mistaken. I should check before I say that. So seven days from now would be the 20. Hold on. It's that's Saturday, right? It's Saturday uh, at 12 p.m. Eastern. Mind you, uh, it's actually technically EDT, Jeff, because of the time zone. I think that's not correct. Uh, we'll be running another a monthly events on the NSG Online event Discord. These events will rotate through time zones. So while this one makes a lot of sense for the West Hemisphere, uh, it's, you know, it's going to change. So these should be entirely free, right? They'll be free to enter. Only prize support will be a Circuit Breaker Invitational Invite for the top finishers for events under 20 players with two invites available for any over 20 players. This is sick. 
I know a big part of the appeal when you're playing organized play is to, you know, get uh, promo cards, stuff like that. But uh, the fact that there's going to be regular, consistent online events is really important as a way for people that don't have like a meta physically in person, a place that they can play. Um, I think that's absolutely fantastic. And it's a really good initiative. And I'm super, super excited. Jeff, let alone NSG is putting this together. Uh, there is a shout out here, though. If you want to stream, organize or judge any of the events, they're looking for volunteers because they want to do this on a monthly basis. And I don't know if Jeff can sign up for all of those. So if you're looking for any part of that, definitely hit up uh, OPNL signal to get some ask some questions, figure out how it will work for you. Uh, this will be very satisfying. I think I'm also really excited. It's always kind of a question is like if how does no signal games in terms of like external testing gather data and the fact that they have like a circuit, you know, uh, circuit system uh, means that they can like have data on like tournament results. Not that there aren't maybe already trawling, always be running. That's really good. I'll just skip to the middle letter and go with ED or PD. It's potentially really important because we're actually an hour off than what people might expect, right? The current runner decks might come down to what can best get out turbine fastest. Yeah, I, I think there's a fear for that. I think it's up to Corpse to make that not the case. But I think if that is the case, we kind of have obviously a different issue to deal with. Yeah, happy daily savings. Yeah. So anyways, that's a Saturday. Sign up. It's totally free. Um, Where do you sign up, Jeff? On Always Be Running, I guess? I'll book someone to update that and include UTC. Yeah, perfect. Cool. There's already people signed up, so check that out. That's sick. That is this Saturday. Banlist will be the 2303 <laughs> selected in ABR. That's a really awesome initiative. The name is also really, really, really good. Cool. Skipping the middle letter on the US time zones is the correct thing to do when the time is the same clock reading during or not during daylight time. I don't think you all have this in America. Do you know that in Canada, there's a half hour time zone on the East Coast? It was always like the funniest thing when you watch TV and they'd be like, this show's on at 6, 6.30 in Newfoundland. And it's kind of like a, a joke. But I find it absolutely amazing that there's a, a half an hour time zone in Canada. It makes sense, right? Like get some granularity in the system. Um, I'm going to start uh, advertising stuff in, in uh, that time zone. All right. So I wanted to do today is we're going to do some deck building. In terms of other news, we're working on our, uh, we should have a video up on Monday. It's not gonna be a gameplay video, but it's about the maths video. And we've done a lot of work on our maths system and it's pretty fun. I have some good data to present. So we'll do that hopefully on Monday, I think. Um, otherwise, in terms of organized events too, currently, I said this before, I'm polling uh, patrons and basically asking them, I gave them a range of dates to say like, hey, patrons, when would it make sense for us to do an online GNK? We're also gonna be doing an online GNK in the next couple of weeks. It won't be on the same day as the one that Null no Signal Games is organizing. It's probably gonna be the weekend after that. And I think it's looking right now, the poll says they're favoring a Sunday, but uh, we'll wait for that poll to close, which will probably be in a couple of days. Hey, Crower, how's it going? Uh, anyways, I'll let you know next week if that's up, um, but that could be as soon as two weeks from now, we'll have an event on Sunday. It'll be free to enter as well. We'll be playing online. It's a GNK. We got some prize support. So check it out. Um, I'm not saying that to not apply again, go to Saturday, win that or lose that terribly, figure out those deck lists, then bring them to Sunday. You know, how you do it. Cool. That's application ends this weekend. Yeah. Orbs. I got to do my application. Um, I'm meeting with the game store that I'm looking that generally is supporting for this sort of stuff tomorrow night. So I'm pretty stoked. I'm going to be doing an application on my side. I know the closure is on the 17th or something. I have a, I have an alert on my phone for Saturday to figure it out. All right. We want to try something. And today we're going to try something that is probably foolish, but we want to try and see something about this game in the standard format. Uh, this is a conversation that kind of came up last night a bit. Uh, I was hanging out in the chat on Jeff's stream is the idea of like mid range HB. It's the sort of like golden era of Netrunner to a lot of like old Netrunner hats of decks that don't exist anymore in a play style that hasn't existed in Netrunner in a long time. Not everyone universally liked it, but for a lot of people, it is like the core representation of when they think what Netrunner should look like. Um, and it's kind of what it looked like back in the day. I'll show you what these decks look like, but it's a. Uh, we're going to start by looking up engineering the future, which was the core set HB identity many, many moons ago. Valdemar, Robocop. What is like, I think I just want to find 2014 world championship. Sandberg 3X. Yo, real talk, JDFQ. I know you posted a comment on the last video I put up with a Sandberg deck. The whole time I was playing, I was convinced I was playing against a Smurf of you. I was so convinced. I'm like, this is JTFQ. There's no way it's not. Where's uh, the 2014 World Championship deck? Is the deck list here? It's on Stimac? Am I looking for 2014 or looking for 2015? I'm looking for 2015. 
Excuse me. That's on me. That's uh, Dave, right? Hoyland? Okay. Looks like it wasn't uploaded. It was uploaded by somebody else. Great. Yeah, 15 was food codes. Okay. So this is the sort of deck that a lot of people think of. In fact, I think this one's a bit later on in, in the future of the game. But for a lot of people, when they think of the fundamental Netrunners, they think of a deck like this. And this deck is maybe not the most exciting, but you'll see in short how this works. Firstly, this is Engineering the Future. You would recognize my server instantly. I don't hide my name. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Engineering the Future was a very simple identity. It was kind of overpowered for a really long time. It was hard to see any other HB identities get played. This just gave you credits to do the thing you wanted to do anyways. I really liked it in a lot of ways. It was fun. You made sure you want to install a thing a turn, but it's not very exciting. But you did get like an extra 20 credits through a 20 turn game, so you felt good about it. It is running the most busted agenda suite of all time. And I don't mean the actual agendas. I mean the two global food initiatives and then seven four twos or three twos mostly for twos. And while these agendas were really good, uh, the agenda suite here, and we'll talk a bit more about this on Monday, is actually one of the best agenda suites you can technically run in Netrunner of all time. Uh, this means that the runner has to steal four of your nine agendas in a 49 card deck. That is incredibly difficult to do. So we're going to try and recreate that. Uh, we can still do that. It's very easy in HB, and we got good neutral and HB identities, uh, agendas, so that's fine. But one of the big things about this deck is that this deck cared about, cared about the remote server and basically it built and put things in the remote server, it had defensive upgrades, a fair bit of them, and it put things in the remote server that generated them economy and then behind their very good ice they would jam in agendas every once in a while. There was sometimes fast advance in some of these decks, the ones that were running more of Vitruvius would sometimes run a single biotic labor, but the idea is this is a very, very basic, very fundamental mid-range deck. Uh, it has relatively, and back then it had some of the best ice in the format, Eli used to be a monster for three credits it's uh, things are definitely very different we had the turing which is an ai hate ice that was really good because ai was pretty prevalent back then and then we had some really mean sentries this is what drafter used to look like it was much more powerful a bit more expensive but much more powerful and then we had some of the bigger uh byroid sentries and i think the sentries are relatively good right now and not a lot of people are bringing sentries efficiently Seriously though, 3x value sandbring and mid-range just throw the runners on turbine off. Also really huge tax for 3x ice scoring server. I feel like there's other ways to do that JTF that don't require you to play sandbrick and then ice it up and get economy that are a bit more tempo positive, I'd reckon. So I don't know. The fact that they trash it for four though, I feel like there's so many things you can put in that sort of server they trash for four, right? Like is a DBS better? Can you imagine playing Eve campaign modernly? Yeah, and sometimes the Eve actually built a second server for it. For what it's worth, we don't have to play Eve. We have to play Refuge campaign, which nobody has ever played ever. So we can kind of see how that works. But modernly, our equivalent for Adonis and Eve is going to be like Nico and then maybe Refuge campaign. My excitement about this deck, and I do think the agenda suite in this deck was unfair, I think before Global Food Initiative, this deck was a bit more exciting to play against, is that this was so much about reading when to get your multi-axis off. Because the runners back then couldn't break this ice as efficiently, as consistently all the time. And so it was like the sort of thing where you knew Adonis campaign is going to take three turns before it ticks off. And then on the fourth turn, they'll put something in a remote server. So you had this window to pressure HQ. And then you had a window to pressure R&D. And you generally played a bit more multi-axis cards. Like things like Maker's Eye were kind of common back then. I guess uh, we had Keyhole back in the day, which was like kind of Stargate. Uh, but like locking R&D at right times, you had this kind of this game in which it was hard to make successful single runs. But so the you kind of need multi-axis, which is pretty good yeah we have to talk about breaker bay grid this was the biggest jump in the power level of this deck i think besides obviously the caprice nase which we'll talk about in a second but this sort of card meant that you can res all your really slow very expensive econ assets for free I think a lot of people goof this up when they first see it. It's the rest cost of each card in the root of the server is lowered by five. The card text is slightly different, which makes it more confusing. You're not resing your ice for free, but you're resing your things like the Eve campaign for free, which means even if they ran it, you can just res both of them and then they have to trash the Eve for five if they want to, let alone the Breaker Bay grid for two. Yeah. Hey, John. Turned into dramatic flashback Caprice. Eh, she seems reasonable, right? Yeah, Eve seems terrible. Eve is definitely wasn't amazing. But their Breaker Bay grid made her way more consistent because you res her a lot of times for free and then she was just two credits a turn. There's no effect in the game like Breaker Bay grid right now. Otherwise, there are a lot of equivalents to a lot of these cards. We have two card archive memories. This is banned now, but this allows us to recur generally our defensive cards, sometimes your economy pieces, but mostly your defensive upgrades. You have three Ash. Ash is what the modern Managarm used to look like. It cared about a trace. Uh, technically now Managarm gives you two options to deal with it. Those options though have a floor, but they also have a ceiling. Ash in theory, if you had a lot of money, you could do trace 300 and then the runner basically had to trash this and run back. And this worked really well on its own or on top of Caprice Nase. And if it's the first time seeing Caprice, 
welcome. Uh, this is one of the most powerful upgrades, defensive upgrades. People complained about this. Uh, there weren't cards exactly at the time like Pinhole Threading, which, mind you, right now we have Anoetic Void, which is meant to be like a modern reimaginary Caprice. It's a card that is technically um, less consistent than Anoetic, but definitely a lot cheaper uh, because uh, you generally only pay up to two credits. You don't have to throw a card out, which is a real cost for Anoetic. Being tuned new to this game is a weird seeing a card from System Core 2019. Uh, not exactly. A lot of these cards, too, like still existed uh, in um, like they're reprinted. A lot of these cards see some amount of reprints. Uh, half of these cards are kind of still legal, I think. Actually, maybe not that many. Like Enigma, Tollbooth, Eli are still legal. Uh, Jackson Howard, mind you, is just Spin Doctor now. It's, it's a fair bit different. Hedgefront Archives are both legal in some formats. And then we have alternate versions for this. This deck is why Rumor Mill got printed. Yeah, maybe. Uh, I think there's a lot of reasons why Rumor Mill would be pretty good. But our question is, is a deck strategy like this good? Because I don't think you see anything like this, exactly at the speed of this deck. I think the closest things you see to decks like this are like the deck that Sokka won Worlds with, which I think was a bit more aggressive than this. Not entirely more aggressive, but a bit more aggressive. That they're kind of jamming out. You got Seamless Launch. You're a bit more of a... You, cards in hand matter more. It's not exactly a combo deck, but you kind of like with precision design, you're going a bit faster. These games would be comfortably 15 turns because it all was about like building your board state slowly while also progressing your economy. And the question is, will this work modernly? And I think if we queue into like a, what's it called deck? Um, a turbine deck? We probably don't win. <laughs> I don't think we do. I think also obviously the the proliferation of um, pinhole threading means it's really hard to depend on these upgrades to, to score out. Not this one per se, but the cards like this. But I wanna see how it works. Again, before we're gonna dismiss it, we're gonna see what we can do that's closest to us. I, I do think we have better ice for what it's worth, but let's see how he goes. Hey, Snowcaster, I can't get a hold of the Android Never Prince from FG. How good is Project Nisei? Is it 1-1 one, one with the original? Are they reprinting original cards? Will there be sets continuing to expand startup? Uh, yeah, to most of those questions, the answer is yes. Also, how's it going? Um, Project Nisei is now called Null Signal Games. You can find their website, nullsignal.games. It's really great. They have an uh, intro it's called System Gateway, which is like your learn to play set that you can pick up. And it's miles ahead of any learn to play system uh, that uh, FFG has ever put out. It's really, really quite good. And then from there, there are a couple cards that are reprints. They have something called the System Update, which is basically just core FFG cards that they thought were important to keep in play. So they've reprinted those with their own stylings and arts and stuff like that. And then since then, they're printing new cards. Uh, there's con constantly new cards for startup. It's about every six months now, it seems like there's a release and startup is always the last cycle from Null Signals plus system gateway and system update. So yeah, we're expecting new cards in June. Old new cards just came out in, in December. So yes to all of them. Are they one-to-one -one with original compatibility? Yes. Some cards are one-to-one -one printed. Some are near prints, like reimaginings and tuned for balance in up or down different directions. So yes to almost all of that, uh, as much as that's hard. We going back in time to mid range, yeah, Eris. We are. I don't have high hopes, but we're excited to see how this is. Seems like a ton of ice. What is the recommended amount of ice? I know it differs, but a guideline. So back in the day, we're here on what six plus eight is fourteen. We're on seventeen. If you're playing honest, like scored behind ice, I would generally recommend between somewhere from sixteen to eighteen. That is dependent on your deck size. That's for forty nine. If you go down to forty four, you can crunch the ratio. I think it's somewhere between. 13 and 15, something along, along that lines. That might be low, but then it depends what your deck is doing, right? If you're an asset based deck, you can run like 22 assets and like nine ice. That's fine. It's more so knowing how heavily you need ice up and that's part of your game plan. But like, this is a big thing is the classic idea of how much ice you should run in this like mid range type deck was about 16 to 18. And I don't know if we exactly see that. I'm actually very excited to pull up Sokka's list to see. Thanks Metro Grid, I'm sold. Yeah, it's really, really good. Um, mind you, uh, Snowcaster, if you want to do organized play, uh, and there are formats that still play some of the older FFG cards and the newer, older ones, right? Like this, there's a rotation, uh, proxies are totally legal. So even if you can't find the FFG products, you can just go print them out. Um, and then you're good to go. So don't worry about that. I think 1718 is more of an artifact of old school of building where non-ice cards were much worse. Yeah, that was kind of the way you interacted with the game. Like before the defensive upgrades got good, you were just kind of trying to slow people down with ice uh, because there weren't really good assets that like were game winning or upgrades that were game winning. So 18 is definitely high. You still see some decks are running 18 to 20. I think Ag Infusion is a big reason, but um, that deck gets more value out of anything. This is closer to like what mid-range rush is. 49, mind you, Sports Metal gets a bit more card draw inherently, so you can play a fair few uh, less cards, I think. But here we're on, oh man, I don't like that gif. Uh, this is only 11. That's a big difference, right? Because they're taxing out. They're a faster game. They have fast advance. So it's not exactly a comparison, but um, yeah, this deck is definitely a fair bit different than where we've come. I just want to try this. We also feared drawing a lot earlier on. 
with open hq yeah you have to hunker down too it's like back in the day too there was like certain single run cards like account siphon was a really really big deal that you had to respect uh there was a card that was basically stargate but you could do it as many times a turn um that mattered to a large extent to some extent uh but cards like this also were really important that you iced up centrals heavily early um so yeah uh cards like this are not exactly in the game diversion of funds is the closest but it's very different Welcome aboard, Snowcaster says Hedonism. How's it going, Hedonism? So let's try and build an equivalent, something like this to see how it goes. Again, I don't have high hopes, but I want to see what it feels like. Um, and we'll, we'll go from that. So we're playing HB. We were playing HB. Where'd it go? <laughs> Hold on. Okay, we're playing HB. We're building a deck. Uh, so we have a couple options. I'm going to not do Thule Subsea. Let me move my face so you can see the, the text. So my... Uh, you can easily play sports metal. Sports metal is just in a good ability. It doesn't seem to be the right choice a lot of times for engineering the future if we want to go slow. So I don't know. I think our best choices are precision design. And really, that's a 40 card minimum deck. So we're a bit different. We have endless iteration, uh, Mirror Morph. I do like this one a fair bit, uh, as long as we like string our turn together in the right way. And there's a bunch of assets we can get some value from. Uh, that's kind of neat. Uh, we have Architects Tomorrow, which I don't want to do. And then we have Asa. So I think it's between Asa, Mirror Morph, and Sports. I think it's probably Mirror Morph. The thing is, though, Mirror Morph, you have to build the deck actually kind of differently, and you have to pursue that, or you have a blank text box. You have to kind of do a bit more. Um, I don't want to do Architects because we're not playing only Byroids, and I kind of hate Architects. So it'd either be Asa or, and, and Mirror Morph. And both of these are like inherently efficiency click compression engines. And Asa Group is actually a pretty reasonable ability if we have, like again, 18 ice, let alone like seven upgrades and six assets or nine assets. So it's between the two. I think if anything, we'd probably start with Mirror Morph and end up playing Asa. So yeah, we'll see how it goes. Thanks for the warm welcome. I'm new, haven't played yet. And this looks like a super way to start getting familiar with how Netrunner player thinks and plays. Ask any question if you want. Also, if you haven't joined in, uh, it's, what is it? Discord.com slash GLC, I think is the invite. Green Level Clearance is like the big community for people who are new to the game, let alone uh, people who've been playing the game for a long time. It's a really nice place to get in, to ask questions, to organize games with newer players or mentors. It's fantastic. Us is probably less taxing on the brain to play. Yeah, it's a fair bit less taxing. And its ability is okay. Ah, uh, thank you, Venice. I think Asa is probably how you end up, I agree. Yeah, it's 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 we're not going to have to jump through hoops to get our ability. And I feel like as soon as we start building a Mirror Morph deck, we end up building something that's very, very different. Okay, I'm going to hit the standard button and we're going to start putting cards together. So our agenda suite has to be this agenda suite. Are you going to build a Sandberg deck? No, definitely not. We're playing two global food initiatives. We'll talk about this more on Monday when our video comes out, but this agenda suite is absolutely absurd. So the idea is that this is a two pointer for the runner. It's a three pointer for us. So if we're only running two pointers and global food initiative, we can win in three scores. They always have to win in four scores. And that's really hard when there's still four out of nine agendas. I might say MM to be honest. I don't know how to trigger it consistently. Like I do think you would play um, uh, MC austerity policy. And I think we're on the verge of like playing uh, nano etching. Like it's probably fine. I don't know. Draw and stall credit like it's an okay turn. Midrange is going to be MC Austerity. Asa's ability is really bad aggressive tempo. Yeah, you're right. The fact like the best thing about Asa is building iced servers quickly, like multiple ice servers, which we're not interested in doing. So we'll see. We'll see how many upgrades we have. We can always cut back and forth. Yeah, nano etching, I think, is like just good enough, let alone the one that you can click to install a card. Like, whatever. All right, so then we're going to run all the four twos that are good. So we're going to be running off world office, which is just a four two that gains seven credits. And then we only have to find, uh, what is it? uh three more agendas so what is the best next thing we can run vitruvius for a bit of uh recursion if we need it otherwise we have access to a three two so we're gonna biotic it out will we see meridian and asa along with maybe nightmare no yo for real i think there's a chance you sangrin like i i think this is something i have to do the numbers on but i think playing meridian unironically is like not the worst like i don't think you can put nightmare archives into anything but like Admittedly, this agenda suite doesn't interact well with negative agenda points, because even if they take a single negative agenda point, they still win on four. But I do think there are certain agenda suites where playing Meridian out of sight of Sports Metal is okay. The problem with Meridian, though, is that if you're not playing a fast deck, they can break it. And that's the advantage of Meridian in like Sports Metal. But like I'm kind of I'm kind of woken up on a bit. Like I, I'm I'm a bit more interested in playing negative agenda points, but I don't think this is the deck for it for a couple reasons. But I think Meridian could see play in other decks. Part of me wants to be a viable gimmick decks, but I also don't like rock, paper, scissors out of games when it's the case. I don't think it's that bad, David. I don't feel like there's exactly rock, paper, scissors decks right now. All right. Um, otherwise, what agendas can we play? We need to play real two pointers. I don't think there's anything we're excited about. Does Meridian just mean they get more accesses though once it goes away? Uh, yes, but if we run enough ice, 
maybe it's not the worst. The face check on this is really good. Um, I honestly think it's okay. The problem is, again, negative agenda points don't work well with their agenda suite because even if they take one Meridian, they still win on four axes. If they take two Meridians, they win on five agenda steals on a nine, though. That is ridiculous. Yeah, it's probably just Vitruvius. I usually hope that there's something more interesting, but like Vitruvius is fine. Um, otherwise, like the four twos in HB are not as good anymore. Like, I'm not excited for any of these. Architect actually is fine. There's honestly a chance the Architect deployment test is okay. Let's just try one of them, just like to see. Rain is one of my most favorite cards. Okay, so we're gonna play all the fundamentals. So we're gonna try and one for one this thing. So spin doctors are our thing. We need to play economy assets in the remote server to see how this goes. So what economy assets are we playing? We're generally gonna try and play cards with the word campaign written on them. So we have uh we have refuge doesn't show up, but I think that's just like a release date thing. We have refuge campaign. It has art, I'm pretty sure. Um, you res this for four, and it pays out in three turns, and at that point, it's okay. We're going to play three of them. It's probably wrong because we don't have Breaker Bay Grid. We'll just play two of them. I think Nico campaign is the thing you want to put in the remote server. Now, I think we're immediately going to run into an issue where we realize the thing we want in the remote server on most turns is like a Rashida or a Marilyn. Or sorry, a Rashida or an NGO front. So these cards that are going to take long are going to be kind of rough. Um, at that point we had like three Rashida and three NGO front. And now you realize we're playing an entirely different game of Netrun and everything falls apart. So we're gonna try to have to work on that. We have three hedge fund. The other deck ran a bit of recursion to get some of his pieces back. Well, uh, what's it called? Arcane Memories is now banned. The best thing we have is restore, which allows us on tempo to get a defensive upgrade back or even like a spin doctor, which is fine. Do we want Trieste? No, Trieste is like one of those setup cards that's really hard to get value from. We're trying to build only one remote server, maybe two, but it's like, as soon as you get into Trieste, it's like very hard to get a board state where this is super relevant unless you're really working hard towards it, which is, you know, the kind of thing. How's it going, Andrew? I think the real problem, negative agenda point cards like Meridian have is, is that slowing the down your opponent is really as good as forwarding your game plan. Um, Yes, but if they're very easy to play, it's, it's an okay trade, right? Fast break also only would work if we're playing a lot of agendas. Like as soon as you want to do fast break and Meridian, like you have to play a bunch of three ones and do something else. Trieste and remote FC3 and scoring server. Ah, if we're trying to build this though, I don't think so, but you could. I just don't know how often people are going to be clicking through ice, especially when we have more ice. And I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. We'll keep it open. Okay, so then we have our upgrades. Back then, we were on three Ash for some reason, so we're going to play two, three Mana Garden. We're going to play two Anoetic. That's going to be our Caprice. We have a single Mavirus, which, yeah, it's fine, I guess. Uh, and then what other upgrades do we have? We have Breaker Bay Grids. Uh, what's the equivalent to Breaker Bay Grid? There's nothing like it, right? There's nothing that gives you that much money. Hey, random Duke, Duke Dice has a random question. I'm looking at Thule deck. Does the core damage mean brain damage, or is that something else? It's exactly the same. It was just a name that was changed, uh, I think, in the summer of last year. It has no difference. Any card that does brain damage back in the day has been reprinted to say core damage. It's entirely the same. Tranquility is kind of close. Oh, yeah, Tranquility is is kind of the best we have. Uh, we're not running a region, so we can play this. This is our tempo thing to install on top of, which is really good with the asset group in theory. It gives us some value. All right, so you're going to realize we have too many assets already, so we have already are going to have to make some, some changes. And now we're going to just jam in some stuff. Seamless. Seamless is really good, but the problem is as soon as we start playing Seamless, we realize that, like, this is the difference. The reason that we don't play mid-range is because cards like this. Like, this is a much more aggressive card, where, like, the cost of checking a card with no advancements on it is kind of night or day with some of this HB ice, and this allows you to play this, like, faster, jammier, seamless launch kind of HB deck. Kind of more, you know, like this. Which, you know, when Worlds, it's probably pretty good. Uh, it's probably just as good now, if not better. So I think we have to avoid doing that. Because as soon as we're playing that slot, it's going to kind of push us away from, like, the really bad thing that we're trying to replicate. Yeah. Colin, how's it going? So at least some of our ice got better. We can still play 3x Eli. Um, I don't know if there's any other barrier we're excited about. We only have one influence left. Like, maybe you can play an IP block. That seems like a card that could have existed a long time ago. Code gates are really good now. We have Fairchild 3 as a 3x that's really really good uh this deck had a toll booth one big thing uh, we now have three bigger things that's pretty good we're running enigma it's fine the deck had good reasons to play end the run stuff i think enigma probably gets outclassed in the format by magnet planogram i don't think for one influence uh maybe ip block is kind of good though we have a single one virus but planogram is like we're meant to be a slow deck we don't actually want to draw very quickly palisade i think we play hogan before palisade right 
Like this thing hits Amakua's, it hits uh, Fermenters on early face check. I think Hagen just got better and better. Is IP block worth it without tag punishment? 100%. IP block is so good. So normal runners get through this for three credits, you res it for two. That's fine. I know they don't need a breaker, but that's fine. Admittedly, the runners that competitively see play with Link, you lost Wu, but you still have Hoshiko and you still have 419. But if they're playing Amakua, this is a problem. IP block is so good. You don't even need any other card in your deck to say the word tag on it for IP block to be good. Where are them pulley ops at? Jai, we're not doing it. We're playing with food coats. We're not building multiple remote servers. Call of City's Eli Plus. You're not wrong. <laughs> well, besides botulus, you're not wrong. It's goofy how that is. This is better on centrals, though. I think we need some taxing separate centuries. Centrals. We'll come back to that issue. I do think uh, I'd rather play Hagen, though. I think Hagen is just better than both of those. That's probably too many. Uh, what other code gates are we playing? Sentries. Well, I want to play some bigger sentries than people are expecting uh, because we need to have some sort of like strength into the mid game. Oh, gatekeeper. Yeah, gatekeeper is so much better now. I forgot about gatekeeper. Again, not great. It's better in a faster deck because the window of it being relevant is longer if the game is just shorter. Uh, but this ability is like obviously really good. The problem is that when this becomes a zero strength code gate, how good is it? I don't know. Honestly, there's a chance, but this might be like one of the like seamless launch type cards. Ash Enigma. Magnet's better than Enigma, modernly, I think. Tier, obviously. I think tier is maybe a bridge too far, but like, I don't know. Still two credits to pass? Yeah, one credit though, right? They just get through this with their buzzsaw. It's one, everything's one credit besides the, well, I hate two credits for Fairchild. I want to play something like this. This is what I want to play. This is not good, but like I want one of the big sentries that nobody plays, like this one. Trace four, add up installed program to his top of stack. If they don't have link, they're face checking to this for eight credits, maybe. The tag is like whatever. Yeah. 3x tier. Come on. I think Ravana is honestly like good enough. I think Ravana fits into this package uh maybe better than just running more barriers. Yeah, let's just play more Ravanas. Is there a better I feel like there's a better like bottom tier century nobody plays that has a name that nobody knows like kamali the runner can do core damage do core damage do core damage free strength though that's terrible okay the hog and trash sub should be in theory be amazing in turbine meta not to figure out how to actually fire it it's still really good like people are playing fermenters turn one and like you can get them i think it's it's not like that's the only weird one there were so many other weird sentries they don't exist anymore it, oh, we have Zed. How good is this? It's bad on turn one, but again, most six cross sentries usually aren't. Um, is this better or worse than Sherlock? So this is six strength. That's a big number. I'm going to just try Sherlock. And then we'll just play drafters. Okay, how much ice do we have? 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Oh, we can run a whole bunch more. Ichi 1, Ichi 2, they're gone. We lost them a long time ago. So this is this deck was really, really greedy. Like, it had some big stuff. So we'll do three drafter. Architect is not drafter, though. Plus one vote for tier over Sherlock. 10 is a lot of money, my friends. That is a lot of money. Seven, the manageable economy. I think we're going to be in a lot of issues. I think we're not going to be able to protect our uh, economy because people are just going to pinhole on turn one, uh, turn two, and then we're going to lose our economy. Um, I don't think it's enough economy to sustain tier, let alone two of these. If we can only Nani a Hagen, you just you can you can you can play Zato. You can Zato your Hagens all you want. You're making fully op look really good. No, but we're only building one remote server. How good is fully op in one remote server? Midling. Like, this is the issue. Is we're going to end up cutting a bunch of these assets. Maybe two remotes. Yeah, I guess with the Refuge campaign, you have to do two remotes because this never, the party never ends in Refuge campaign land. This is going to be really bad. This already looks awful. This already looks really, really bad. <laughs> we haven't even started and I don't like this. Like, you just can't put enough money. Okay, we're at 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So, like, let's just try and get to 17. We did it. 
Imagine this ended up being sandbag. It will never, I will never play sandbag JTFQ. Not even once. I do not like that card. It is a miserable card for everyone. 17. Okay, so we need to get more money into this. That's for sure. I'm going to play three refuge campaigns. And then we're going to cut a mana garm. And we have to cut four more cards. Seems like it should have ganked. Don't even encourage me. That will be a mistake. Trieste is worse than Sandberg? No, it's not. Wait, Trieste Mono Boys is worse than Sandberg? Uh, the amount of effort you need to play a Sandberg deck, you basically can only do one thing. Do you need your restore? No, I don't. But this is like meant to be our, our, you know, our card that's meant to replace this thing. So like, okay, we're off script. That's fine. Cut them a virus, play two government subsidy. Honestly, yeah, maybe. I think that's fine. Um, it's just... Hansa is going to be a bit hard to do with two Anoetics already. The issue is like, I don't know how often we're going to float 10. Trieste is worse to play against when it's working than Sandberg. I don't think so. You can just hit one bad Byroid and you'll generally be okay. You can be locked out by Sandberg. Okay, I still don't think we have enough money. So what we could do is we can play one more agenda and just play 22 points. That would upset me. That would be fundamentally quite upsetting. So it's either we cut the NGO fronts or the Rashidas. How close are we to a mirror morph deck? Honestly, pretty close. We have 15 assets. So like refuge is kind of bad. Cut the NGO too many clicks that could be installing cards. <laughs> it's, it's good. Click compression. You get this down and a nice. Yeah, this is looking mid, but that's kind of, kind of the point, right? Like we knew what we were walking into. <sighs> I don't know. This is not good. Sandbrick does not lock you out if you do not break the ice. You got to break that enigma. You got to break it somehow. You just botulous it. Okay, this is bad. Is the main way to address Sandberg runner side to play stuff like inside job and botulous and boomerang? Just be very thoughtful about your excesses. Yeah, there's a lot of ways around it, right? Like a lot of the ways that people decry, right? Like endurance deals with it really well. But then like the other stuff people decry, like, you know, uh, boomerang botulous, inside job, you can play security nexus. But then on top of that, like pinhole threading, light the fire. There's a lot of ways to deal with it. Um, the problem is it's like one of the Netrunner decks that doesn't want to win on turn 15 and wants to win on turn 22. And like, I don't think it's fun. Kill Geon in front's one Trank. I think Trank is like low key, really good. I can cut one of these. Yeah, that's for sure. You can also just run aggressively in the Sandberg deck struggle to get going. Yeah. When I played San against the Sandberg deck on my channel, I respected the ice way more than I thought it would. Cause I thought it would be more like program destruction, lockout, like next nonsense, but it's not, it's just like a bunch of end of run stuff. If you can contest like the, uh, what's it called? Their stuff and trash their stuff so they can't actually get their uh, fully ops off. The deck generally doesn't function very well. So you have to trash the Nasexes and you have to just make sure they can't have stuff in remote servers so they can fully op. On average, they're like, they have either huge ice or really cheap ice and they can res the fully, the cheap ice for sure, but they can't res everything. Also just play Mad Dash. Just play Mad Dash, you win. Are you sure you don't want Maryland's instead of Refuges? I want to try Refuges. Uh, Maryland would probably be fine, but I want to try this because it's bad. Okay, we have to cut three cards. Um, we don't want fast card draw. Three credits? <laughs> no, thank you. All right, we have a deck. Uh, it's... it's gone. No, no, she she's gone. We lost Rashida. We how? Why do we want to draw cards? <laughs> Drawing cards is bad. That's how you flood up. You, <laughs> we've made we've made some bad problem mistakes. Um, mid range, yeah. No, this is gonna be a disaster. I don't think we're proving anything because this is not a good list. Um, but like even trying to build this list kind of shows you like all the things that we want to play are more tempo based as opposed to this list, which inherently nothing it does is tempo based. Besides breaker bait grid resing something cheaply. Now we're yeah. Now it's not 2015. It's 2013. Let's see how 10 years of never in history has progressed. Do you think competitive runner decks is a mad dash deck right now because of the rampant five threes? Um, we'll talk about it more on Monday when we show the results of the gender crunches. But um, mad dash is absurdly good into five threes. Competitively, that was the bigger thing for the last like six months. Uh, but even without five threes, mad dash is one of the best cards you can put in your deck. Show me a competitive uh, corp deck, and we'll, I'll show you how good the mad dash is. We can run the numbers. It's, it's absurd. It, it's such a good card. It's like kind of the best card in your deck, barring the ones that give you credits. Those are cool too, I guess.
Okay, this is gonna be bad, but don't worry, we'll we'll change it. We'll like make a change. We'll put the Rashida back in. Honestly, I think the Rashida is better than the op uh, the NGO front. Let's make that change. Uh, yeah, well, we can easily make that change. Rashida is just better for our ability. We'll cut out of refuge. Yeah, let's be reasonable. I successfully stargated a Mad Dash to Luminal against Sports today, and I still lost with twice on clean four axes and RD runs. Were they drawing a lot? Did you run HQ? Did you play fundamentals? Yo, Mad Dash is really fun in those like sports medals because you can just hit it anytime you want. You can just just send it central. Doesn't matter. Corp. Mad Dash is amazing and should be at least considered in pretty much every runner deck. I think you should it should be your first card. And then every other card, you should build around it. Okay, it's uh, Kiko. This feels like the sort of power level you'd expect in 2015. No idea. Uh, again, it is Shaper, so there's a chance that she's going to have the, um, the Turbine. 12 influence, though. Stop yelling at me. You're, you're frightening me. Okay, opening hand, we have Nico Marilyn. We have Tranquility. We have Hedge Fund. How scared are we multi access on R&D? Long time, first time. Oh, cheers. Welcome. I will keep that. Could do worse. Love all the things. Oh, that's very kind. Mad Dash is worth like three to four random axes. Is better than most multi axis cards. Yeah. So it's like it's three to four multi axes usually in a lot of decks. In a, like a lot of kind of decks like this. Uh, in this one actually, I think it may be a bit more. But like against the forty four six agenda decks, it's about seven axes. It's like six to seven axes. It's like buck wild. They were fishing for agendas two HK. The audacity ready to go. Oh no, good. I want to play 49 card runner deck because he puts four mad dash in. All right. How do we start this? We have uh, Nico and remote server. Okay. We have an ability. So let's get the Nico going. We can also get the tranquility going. But I think we need money now. So that's our ability. We'll play the hedge fund and we'll, I don't think we install the tier because I think next turn we do a double install with this. But I think we have to make them think we have ice here. Now we're going to res this if we're on 10. We have to make sure we subsidy out of this. So there's actually a chance that we don't res this. Maybe for that reason, we should put the Trank in there. Because if they run that and trash for four on turn one, I think we're happy. Three to four random access is so like worse than the full deep data mining. For what it's worth, the current actually might be better. All right, they trash on turn. They trash on turn one. How are they going to have economy? They have to have a creative commission. Oh, they do. That's very good for them. All right, Nico's credit positive. Okay, we can subsidy out. Okay, so we draw once. If we don't draw nice, okay. Here, we're going to draw one more. No, we're not going to draw here. I think we just, like... I think we double government. We're going to lose the Rashida, which is a bit ugly. But if we draw once, we have a pretty good chance of drawing an agenda. It's about one in... F uh, one in four. So I'm just going to hit this. And I think we're going to click for credit and not play the subsidy. It's weird. Minimally playing the subsidy is good because we could threaten both of these reses. Yeah, but not that I want to res the tier when the subroutines actually are not that relevant. Okay. You can get an axis. Or two axes in theory. That locks us. That's kind of good. I honestly wonder if resing the tier here will be correct. On the verge of it. We could have considered it. I don't know what their killer is, but now they have to awkwardly like SMC for something. Now he doesn't know how to have another subsidy in hand he can whiff on. All right, it's happening. We're getting turbined. Uh, let's see if we can get there. So here we can pay a credit, I guess. They paid zero. We have to play different. Otherwise, they see two cards. So they cost us one credit. That's fine. Now, if they, they break this for a lot of money until they get the turbine down, they know we have a magnet, which like not really worth installing into a buzzsaw. So could have had a gatekeeper, I guess. So at least we can double ice that up. This server will be free next turn. Let's draw once. Okay, this is where it starts to get ugly, where we don't have any of our defensive upgrades. In fact, we did have a couple of them in the deck. Let's try once more. Oh, I hate it. I am... This doesn't seem good. That's bad. Now, I'm hoping that this keeps him out of HQ. We will res a Fairchild here, because either they pay, uh, what is it, 7? Or their whole turn. Crashing the Nico on its last click is actually like kind of effective. Um, admittedly, you could do this before, but now if they can either pay nine, which they can't, so they generally have to click through this. Because no matter what, they're gonna lose six. 
So you probably click through it, yeah. And now we lose our that, which is fine, because now we, we get away with a lot here. Wow, that was really... I was so surprised they went for that. But I get it. Oh, man. Oh, man. Draw once? Okay, we're fine. I just wish we had another, like, ice. We have 18 ice? <laughs> we have 18 ice in this one, huh? So I think we can bluff. It's either like we play the government or we bluff an upgrade. So it's either we play the government subsidy or again, we bluff an upgrade. I'm going to bluff an upgrade. Okay, they should definitely be running HQ here. We've gone through 11 cards. Sorry, how many cards have we gone through? 19 cards and we haven't scored an agenda. Like HQ is flooded if they're do dividing by five, which you always should be dividing by five. Let me teach you something, Netrunner, if you're new Netrunner. Generally, agendas are one in five. Just divide by five. Every time I draw five cards and we haven't scored an agenda, and again, we haven't shuffled any cards back, there's an agenda in there. Pinhole threading, this is totally fine for us. They hit a tranquility. Trash that for four if you want. They did. Okay. All right. Okay, so here we can get an agenda in the remote server. So we can do... What do we want here? Do we want, I don't think we want the off world. I think we'd rather do install advance with the architect. So we can draw once, install advance. No shit. We can install advance subsidy. That's fine. Uh, we don't have another install here, unfortunately. We've been really unlucky with our ice. If we just drew another ice there, we'd be really safe. But we have more money than we thought we did. Okay. This is a good chance of hitting an agenda. Yeah, Vitruvius. Again, that tracks. We've gone through a fair few cards. Off-world, okay. That, that's not unreasonable. Like, the amount we assumed, you probably thought there was at least one agenda in HQ, so I don't hate these runs, as much as they're not, like, developing their board. Okay. So here we can look at the top five and get something. So we have an off-world office. We can do anything, right? What's the text on this? When you score this agenda, look at the top five. You may install and res one of them, ignoring all costs. Off-world, Eli, Nico, Hagen, Fairchild. Do you think we just put the Fairchild on the remote server? Um, R&D is pretty good. There we can do the Nico. Definitely not a tempo deck. I know, Ysegrid. It's not, but like we we flooded. Like what we had to jam. But you're totally right. Like, like looking at the food coats deck, none of those agendas were tempo positive for them. And all our agendas are tempo positive. So like it really incentivizes to score as soon as we can. And merely though, if we didn't score, we flooded. You would have done this, but you, you, I know you're not wrong at all. That's so sick. That was the one of in the deck, which I would appreciate more than Vitruvius. Reminds me of the time Fisk Investment Seminar was a reasonable include. Yes, force the carp to draw. <laughs> Benetier, yeah. There were some decks where that was a really fun card. I, I like that card a heck of a lot. As much as there's a lot of ways to play it really poorly. But I, I was a Fisk fan. ABT was super tempo positive. It was the only one, but it was not the card that you're firing consistently unless you had a spin doctor on the table or... um. You're playing against, uh, it's here, it's here, it's here, it's happened. Or you're playing against what's it called? Um, uh, blackmail. Well, we jam. <laughs> they spent a lot of money though. Like the fact that they don't have money makes sense. Like they've spent so little developing their side of the board. So we can do install advance hedge fund. Uh, the problem is that like, if we need the analytic void, we're going to need, uh, more cards in hand. I think we just get that in there. IAA, always fire ABT. I don't want to IAA. I think next turn. The problem is also we haven't found a food yet. So once we score this out, we still have to score another agenda. Again, you can build this agenda suite with uh, two ones in it. ABT, I got a really good ABT in the last limited uh, draft we did. It was like a bad ABT. It was like two one cost ice, but it was also two ice and no agenda. So you're like totally happy about it. Yeah, this is mid range, right? This is what mid range was meant to look like. Now they have to decide again. This is expensive to run. This is five strength. It breaks this for two, this for two. Dirty laundry archive. You might as well go HQ here. I don't know why they're running archives. Hashtag mid range. Yeah, when you draw all your agendas in the top, like I guess we did go through half the deck, but I don't know. We haven't found our, we found one defensive upgrade, one pinhole down. Okay, so 
how do we mid-range this? We want to advance this once. We want to have at least two cards. We draw once. Okay. So we can advance this once and we can double install, which allows us to fire an Anoetic once. Is that good? The problem is I want a Nico campaign in this server. We have to ice up two to play around pinhole, which is kind of difficult. Only 12 influence. Maybe they're not on three. It's almost like Rashida pushed you forward. <laughs> Yeah, we know how happy we would have been if we had a refuge campaign getting two credits. <laughs> two credits a turn. Are you kidding me? Yeah, no, Rashida seems to be really good, huh? Okay, thinking. I think even if they steal this agenda, we're like okay about it, unless they mad dash us. We always want to threaten RD. Uh, so I think we advance this. I want to keep two cards in hand at a minimum and not the Nico because they could trash that, but it's hard for them to trash that and then run server one. So we'll start here and either we install one card or two card. I think, I think we just install one card. I think we're fine with that. Like they know that we know they don't know to have a fractor. This looks like a defensive upgrade. It is obviously it's a good one too. Managarm would just do enough though. I think double advancing hits too is also pretty reasonable because now once we score this out, like that's our whole turn. I'd rather be able to score and jam because that means we're doing Asa every single turn. At least we get like forward tempo from the, uh, Potential Nico. Almost like Rashida pushed you forward. Yeah. Imagine we had NGO fronts though instead, am I right? It's like so hard. Like this is not what the board state looked like in 2015. It not this. But like, I don't know what to do. It's so hard to play mid-range. Like we just always end up doing this sort of thing. I don't think they're happy with their economy. Their ability has failed to be relevant. Admittedly, once they're set up, it's relevant. But like, it cost us one credit and it cost them three influence. We iced up R&D, but we iced up R&D anyways with whatever we have. And now that it's not first click, it's hard for them to run because like, heaven forbid we res a Sherlock. Am I right? <laughs> How much influence have we spent? Or we've seen? We've seen Buzzsaw, Deuces. Oh, Mind's Eye. Cool, cool, cool. So this console is seeing a fair, a bit more play. Um, it works with Wake and Plan. It works with uh, not a Kiko. Oh, it does work with a Kiko. No, it doesn't. This is successful access cards. No, it does. It should. It should work, right? I know they changed the wording on it. All right, we have money. So we anything we put in the remote server, they kind of have to figure out what it is. But yeah, this card, uh, I think the text is actually a fair bit different in Null Signal. It's whenever you breach, which means you can actually, sorry, it's access to top card R&D. I think it's breach R&D now with the click ability. So I think it works with Wake and Plant. So if you play like a Padma deck, you can charge the Mind's Eye as long as it has a charge on it, or you can charge the Wake and Plant, which means you basically have a button to click to see like the top three or four if you set it up. Um, it's kind of a cool thing to do with Padma. Also, the, sh the console slot, like Onicom is really quite good, I think, but um, you could do it. If you click the preview, it shows you the NRDB text. Which preview? This? Oh, sick. Thanks. Thanks, Dizzy. Whenever you make a successful run R&D, you may place one power counter this. Three hosted power counters breach R&D. That's the big change because Wake Implant fires when you breach. Now, Akiko says whenever you access the cards from R&D, so they do work together. These, mind you, did come out in the same set. They're two cards apart. But, like, I've almost never played against Mind's Eye. I'm very excited to see how they deal with tier, though. What's the reference for Fairchild? Most HB ice are Nordic mythology theme. I'm not actually sure I know what Fairchild is. But yeah, most of them are uh, this. She kind of looks like a Valkyrie, though. I'm not sure I know what a Fairchild is. All right, we just need an agenda. There's a lot of them. Ugly. Oh, man, that's the agenda we have. I, it kind of makes sense. But now we have to score for like. Akiko's also eroded to breach. Sick. All right, well, I'll do a Hagen. They don't have a breaker yet. I think we're going to hedge fund because we have a lot of stuff to, uh, to res. We always want to hold an even amount of cards, though. Fairchild might be a reference to the Fairchild Semiconductor. I don't know what that is. They're really going through their deck. I don't know what their economy is. They haven't played a Telework. Uh, they've played two creatives, three gambles, though. One dirty laundry. So there's not that much burst uh, run events stuff or like event stuff. 
Don't advance it this turn. Advance it double next turn. Yeah, we're not going to advance it this turn. We want to keep it as a secret for as long as possible. And next turn we can double advance and maybe get a defensive upgrade. You're going to pinhole it, which is sick. Yeah, so they did expose. So that's important. That's the second pinhole. They could be on third. Uh, mind you, they only have 12 influence, which means that, uh, again, um, I don't know what the pinhole is there for. Maybe Rashida? Oh, they have a nanotech. That's actually pretty good for them. <laughs> not, not for their 10 strength tier. But in theory, if there's a sentry on the server, like they break drafter for two. I think two is good enough. We get good card draw there. Okay, so now Ravana looks really bad. They break for one credit. This they break for one credit. This will be six strength, but this breaker will have three, four, five. Six, so that's not good. So the only way to make the server more taxing is to get an Eli on it. So yeah, tempo, tempo. It's all about tempo. Uh, uh, mid range, mid range, mid range, mid range ginger deck. Oh God, this is perverse. Fairchild Semiconductor International Inc. was an American semiconductor company based in San Jose, California, founded in 1957. I'd be very surprised, John, if it's not. Like, this art is way more evocative than some semiconductor company from the 60s. Maybe it is. Steve is down. I don't think we mind. Uh, they could Steve pinhole, but, like, that's fine. They have some really slow cards in their deck, like Cyberdelia. You can have sure gamble. That server one is disgusting. We can res most of it. But they've accessed, like, they'd access to when they should have accessed. Like, their HQ runs are good. And I think if they divide by five, they get there. Like, that's that's really good. Oh, they can't even play it. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, but here they can't run. So like, ah, beans. So yeah, they struggle to make a lot of accesses. Um, so yeah, it's gonna be game regardless. But we did not play the way that we thought we were going to play, but the hand we were dealt really disincentivized us too. And like you see Rashida, it kind of gives you, gives you so much gas. Like you have to go. Like here's three cards. What are you going to do with them? A good game. I think it's interesting, right? Like there seems to be a power vacuum for Shaper or more so like people are trying to figure out what ID to play. Akiko is definitely one of the Shaper IDs. I catch you around, eh? Uh, but yeah, I don't know. Influence is pretty good. That ability doesn't seem that good. Like, this is the sort of thing. It's like, is this text that relevant on turn one? Sort of. Turn two? Kind of. Turn four? Maybe. But like, can you just play Conduit? Or other multi-access? Maybe. Hey, Neon, how's it going? I almost never managed to make catchy streaming. Thanks for putting out these videos and doing what you do. That's very kind. Thank you. Welcome to the stream. Uh, it's 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 live. <laughs> if you were watching the VODs, maybe you didn't believe it. Um, no, but hey, welcome. Considering the size of the remote, would you Jinja matter in this deck? Faceless, it would be okay. But we kind of set out to build something closer to um, the 2015 Worlds winning deck, which doesn't look anything like that. So I hope not. But if all we're doing is rushing in a remote server, I hate Jinja. I don't like Jinja. I think Jinja is like kind of the worst netrunner. It's just like, oh, I'm going to smash everything in one server and hope I don't lose on centrals. And like, I don't like that netrunner. But uh, it's ended up to be what we played. But that being said, we had a tier on R&D. Like R&D was sorted. This is bad. They know the game is in server one. Why not try and win? Uh, they definitely could have ran, but they just didn't have the money. Like they literally did not have the money to deal with the Fairchild threes. Yeah, just, the economy was a problem. And this could be more horizontally fully up kind of play. Yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a totally different deck. Like we set up to do a thing. And so we built a bad deck. It's really easy to look at this and be like, why are you not doing fully op? It should be an asset deck. But um, no, it's because we're trying something that's not good to try and see something. The best shaper ID right now is a Sable Deep Dive. No, I don't even think so. I think the Sable, the shaper IDs are okay. They're just not very exciting, I don't think. Thanks, you too. I love As. I think As is kind of shaper-ish. Um, question is, what's As is going to do to us? Uh, if there can be some cheap runs on central servers, with coffee, you'll get stuff out with prognostic Q loop. That's pretty good. We have to watch out for diversion. Uh, this hand is like, okay, it's not bad. It's okay. I'm a big as fan. I definitely want to be playing more as. I think we played an as list on stream. Oh, my foot's asleep. A couple uh, weeks ago, and we did not put enough time into it to like figure out how it works, but it was really, really cool. And I want to play more of it. So we can do first turn Rash Fairchild Rashida. That really incentivizes us to res the Rashida, which is like kind of a disaster if we go down to zero credits. We have to ice up HQ relatively well. Hagen eats coffee cups. It eats um, 
It eats an Amakua. We have to Ice of HQ. So I do think we do Fairchild on their mode server with the Tranquility. You want to do this one first. And then we'll put this on HQ and just click free credit. And then next turn we can install these two together maybe. Hey, I got to call a night. Excited to hear how the rest of this goes. And best of luck with Miramor if when I think we'll let you play a slower game. Which will, yeah, no, I, I hear you. I kind of wanted to. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evening, Jeff. I think at some point we might, because I do think it's going to allow us to like, you know, click our things and not push ourselves forward. As perverse as that is. So if we res this, it ends the run. The axes on HQ, like if they hit the mana garm, we're fine. It's only if they hit the Rashida, it's bad. But I don't want to show them what ice this is. They didn't trash that. I thought they would. Nuka, cool. It comes down for zero credits, mind you, as installs connections or hardware or jobs. In theory, they're job cards, I, I've heard, uh, for one cheaper. First to turn. So that's good. Hey, Macron has gone. Got to turn into happy mid raging. Hey, thank you, Sauce. Thanks for dropping in. Top of RD, a lot of agenda still in there. They didn't contest this. Again, you're going to see a lot of players not want to face check uh, if they don't have three clicks. So, generally, if this can survive the first click, it's kind of hard to face check into it. They know we have a drafter. So, they know there's a mana garm here. I think we will do this as expensive as this is. We'll put this on RD and click for credit. We don't have a lot of money. So, like, we really need the Rashida to fire off. If we had a Nico in their mode server, we'd be okay about it. As much as Fairchild 3 doesn't uh, uh, protect that well. Masterwork. First time they install hardware, which includes this, they draw a card. And because their hardware comes down cheaper, that's really good. Let alone now they can clicklessly install stuff. It's a bit awkward on JNet because you can't res until they give you permission. Uh, you have to watch the chat log pretty vehemently. As a doof. This is why we didn't res, uh, but now resing this. So this is interesting. You messed resing the Tranquility was down on purpose. Oh no, that was a huge mistake. Oh yeah, we would have had another credit. That'd been okay. So here we have to duck. So we want to res the Hagen. That'll put us to three. Yeah, no, that's a misplay for sure. So that's four. We can do five, six, seven. So we're just going to res everything. So they boomerang through this. But the way that you play around this is you res everything. So now they can't divert you. And now it's hard for them to run this because they have to pay the mana garm tax. And then if they do that, they can't trash the Rashida. So we'll be able to recover. But yeah, we 100% should have res the Tranquility. A huge mis a mistake. Having another credit here, we would have just lost it. So maybe it didn't matter. Maybe we would have gone for the card draw. But yeah, no, definitely you, you, you don't want to do what I did. All right, Rashida here is the nightmare scenario. Ooh, Refuge Campaign. Okay, what do we do here? Refuge Campaign behind Ravana doesn't really do anything. Uh, Sherlock, mind you, this is a linked up runner, so there'll be six credits to get through this and maybe a click. That's still not bad. Uh, it doesn't boomerang really well, which is nice too. But we need to get something res. I think here we could click for three credits, but then we're still weak to diversion. So I think we want to go horizontal. So if they diversion us, it's like, okay. Um, maybe we install the refuge in server one to get credits. Like that's also kind of fine. I think we just need the refuge to land. So this is unique. So we don't want to res it. I think we can probably just credit credit install here with an ice. It's really ugly to get this on the outermost. We're weak to diversion here, but immediately if they diversion us, I think we're happy because we just res the refuge campaign. They might pinhole. Pinhole makes so much sense with uh, Chesma. And they just finished their Nuka. Not that we're expecting charge. Love it. Oh, God, I want to play more as. Every time I see as, I remember how. Fun as is. As is so fun. So this is a complicated card. First time they run, they get a look at the top two cards of their stack, which means for credit, they can install one of them, which if it's a hardware, they draw a card. They've already drawn once a turn and they can fire this on our turn because the once a turn saving from as cares about their turn and our turn as separate turn entities. It's such a cool engine. Uh, we have, we're expecting to see a lot of the cheaper hardware stuff like boomerang is obviously a three of. Okay. Do we res the refuge campaign? I feel like we kind of don't want to. Now maybe we've committed to a bad remote server. All right, uh, what are we doing? At least we are playing mid-range. We are successfully mid-ranging. Coffee is going to come down. We need to get a second ice here. If we install this remote server, we draw. But admittedly, if we do that, um, it'll be kind of rough because uh, we'll use our ass uh, ability. So I think we install game two and install on HQ. We're playing Refuge. I'm not sure even if, uh, I mean, the card. No, 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 this is, this is good. And then we'll just ice up HQ. Uh, we need to make HQ relatively taxing. Uh, admittedly, this Ravana ain't it. 
think we could put this. It's more of a bluff than it is anything we can actually res. But once this is res, at least the Ravana is reasonable as much as it will get boomeranged. Certain new remote THG plus ice. I think it's a possibility, but I don't, I'm not excited to do it. Like, well, I want something to put into it. I think getting tranquility in another remote on its own is probably not the worst. Yeah, maybe it's fine. How many refuge? I think we're on down to two refuge in the list, which is a huge disappointment. Class act. Okay, so they just set up. Set up. That's perfect. Okay, so we'll draw one for better ice. Um, That can draw for better ice, but it eats our double install. That's actually kind of good, though, because we'll do new remote and install that. That we could res it. Then we can get the tranquility down, which is what we want to do anyways. Now the problem is we have a refuge where we want our scoring remote and our disposable remote out here. We kind of messed that up. Dirty laundry, just go in archives. It's, they get all these triggers. Hey, Pat, how's it going? So they get a look top two of the stack. Once they're ready, we let them in. Again, pinhole threading is so strong right now because they don't commit to the access or what card they're going to like access until. Yeah, they're going to pinhole here, right? Oh, not even. Just get down Miss Bones for one. But then, like, we have to crack our Spin Doctor and they can still trash the uh, Mana Garm. They're just going in for money. Again, they need money. They're going to have a lot of money now. Now that Patrick isn't around, we're playing fun decks. Man, this deck is really not good. Oh, you're rich. You can swap the purpose of server one. Yeah, eventually we will. But, like, we've only got two credits off the Refuge campaign. I think we got the Tranquility, too. So here we need nine credits, but the server is, like, kind of butt. So I think we just have to hold. So I think we res this. And then we put that in. The problem is the more we draw, like the more likely they are to run HQ. Oh. Whoops. I forgot about that. Yeah, we might as well put these back in. They're really good. So we'll put that back in. Uh, we'll put this on front. We'll just gain two. Gain credit. Turns out we might score out the one that doesn't have upgrades, I guess, maybe, sometimes. I'm not excited to score out a blank Vitruvius, but like, hey, this is why you play Seamless, right? So you don't have to show them. I don't know. I feel like we're going to hold on to this refuge way longer than we need to. Don't worry, there's no archer in this. It can't be that fun. I wonder how good archer is. It's technically, you don't, uh, you don't hit it that easily with the turbine, right? It's slightly over the top. They have been running though. Like we are expecting coffee. They haven't got breakers yet. Archives is open and actually just getting anything on archives is worth it. So they can't get a free prognostic masterwork run. Oh, cool. Gabali. So they might be like on wasteland engine. Um, they could be on poison vial as well, but this is a really cool card. It doesn't inherently work very good with their ability, but they're actually calling us on this, which is like kind of sick. So now they need to get a boomerang down. Because Boomerang and Gabali will do it. But that means actually the Ravana will connect. So we have to spend nine credits, but I don't think they get through the server. Immediately they could like just Gabali through the Fairchild and Boomerang this. But we have to wait for their for their trigger because they can now hear they're waiting to trigger the Masterwork Prognostic. And if they see a Boomerang on top of their deck, so let's see what they Boomerang. Yeah, that's good. Because now we can Boomerang this. So they can Boomerang Gabali through it, but then if they continue the Ravana, as long as they don't have a Boomerang on top of their deck, uh, will hit. Which means we can do a core damage or end the run. And maybe they can click through one of these. So we'll just do fire all and broken. Oh, so it's pay three or trash. Yeah, cool. Oh, actually, they get through all of this. That's pretty wild. So now we have the Ravana. So the Ravana, they can go and click. They have one click. So unfortunately, we didn't put a Nico in here, which would have been sick. Just the thought, why wouldn't Daily Quest fit more than a Refuge Campaign when we can find the influence? I don't think we can easily find the influence in this deck. Because we're on like two animatic. But like Regolith would be better, right? Like I, I think if we just want money now, Regolith is much better. But then we probably should be playing Mirror Morph regardless. Now, the, if the back doesn't come down, how many cheap runs do they have with this sort of engine? Well, that was expensive. Oh, they had Miss Bones. That actually wasn't that expensive. Okay, we're destitute, but we do have a scoring server. So can they run through this again? They could run through it. They could boomerang with the Ravana. Their deck was just shuffled. They can click through the Fairchild. So I think we'd have to do something like this. So I think we double install these. I agree the regular is better, but it's trying to channel that Eve feeling. I don't know. Yeah, but it falls into the same camp of things like we don't want to trash. But yeah, Refuge is like super mediocre. Okay, we're definitely gonna be drawing into agendas. I think we can maybe clear our hand. What are we hoping to draw into? Edge ones would be okay. We want to double install this and then we don't really have a turn. We need to get our credits up. Yeah, regular would be so good. Hey, John, we're trying to play something close to the 2015 world's winning engineering the future deck. 
I think we just jammed these and then click for two credits. I'm gonna do the upgrade first. Cause I think that's tricksy. Oh, whoops, wait. That ain't it. I missed. Sorry. <laughs> these are meant to be in the server. Thanks. Yeah, it's not very good. It's slow. We're trying to get <laughs> trying to get a economic value off cards like Refuge Campaign, which is a bit foolish. Bravado running server one again. Can we res this? Yeah, we can. Let's see if they get a boomerang down. The problem is we can't res two of them. We're actually short of this being super meaningful. And this is really annoying because they can actually contest the server. We might want to anoetic void this hand. All good. And as soon as they crush this, we have no economy, right? Okay, so we can res the Ravana. So now they have to double click through this unless they have prognostic the boomerang on top of their deck. Can res the outer and still anno? Yeah, we can. The problem is like we have to anoetic wait an agenda. So we can't afford this. We still have two cards for the Nico thinking. So the thing is, if we hear they actually no. The mana arm just ends it. This run doesn't do anything anymore. Yeah, it's fine, because they can't pay five or two clicks. Yeah, so this doesn't do anything. Yeah, they can't afford mana arm. We're safe here. But there was an interesting choice because either we want to keep our money for Nico or this, but unfortunately they're a bit short. They got eight credits off the like Barada, like that's fine. Um, but they didn't trigger any of their once per turns, which I think is good for us. Order doesn't matter. <laughs> now this is the issue too, is like Miss Bones is buck wild. So against a lot of decks, you might actually be interested in just putting this into a naked server, but we can't. All right, we're also going to try and like play the way that Spin Doctor used to back in the day, which is just use it to control and get the agendas out of hand. Uh, never mind. Uh, what? Cool. Cool, 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 cool. Uh, cool, cool, cool. Okay, that's fine. Oh, everything's a turbine deck. What would we? Of course, everything's a turbine deck. What were we thinking? We didn't think we would see turbine in every deck tonight. Oh, my bad. It's in every deck tonight. Whoops. Yeah, I know. Turbine replaced boat. I, I'm. Look, I said this before. I think we're gonna regret missing boat now because I think some of the alternatives are worse. And uh, I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, we, we have 17 agendas. Oh, it's meant to be 17 ice. Wait, I think we might have put 17 agendas in. Yeah, actually, I think we can change that, though. Yeah, no, we've seen Turbine in every single faction tonight. Five strength is in a new three. And, like, how bad is it now? This gets broken for a credit. Let alone, they can also now click through this and, like, Poison Vial, which is kind of sick. How long until Turbine gets banned? Honestly, I don't know. But it's it's, like... It's up to Corp Dex to now in the next couple of weeks figure out how to beat Turbine, which I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I don't, that's wild. Fun fact, Takobi's cheaper replacement to Turbine. No, it's not. But Takobi is reasonable. Takobi requires you to interact and then break stuff. Like you can't buzzsaw through a Ravana and then like your Takobi needs to break two ice to give you one ice of strength. They're like, they all do the same thing. But like Leech is better than Takobi. And both of those are Eclipse like Turbine. Sandberg, Sandberg is not the answer. And even if it was, that's not good. All right, here we go. Do we force them into the server that have, well, admittedly they don't have breakers yet, but like, we're not going fast. I feel like FA has been the only viable option for countering super strong runner shenanigans. Hey Dana, yeah, you can play sports metal. <laughs> Just play sports metal. Like play the sports metal from, you know, uh, every sports metal deck. But like, this is the issue and like, Okay, thinking. So this is the point that we kind of played this. This is turn nine. Our economy is not very good and it's based off of time. And currently runners will crush you. Like, I don't think we're proving anything here because this was kind of the thing that we knew coming into there. If we play into a turbine deck, we lose on the spot. Does that mean the turbine is unfair? We can push that kind of decision to later down uh, the street. But like, if you want to play a game where it's just like, I'm going to play reasonably, t like some of the best taxing ice in the certain format, it doesn't work no more. So that's what we're saying. That being said, I don't think this is the deck you wanted to bring anyways. And it just kind of shows you the difference between how Netrunner might have been back then and now. 
Uh, okay. Now they break for free, I know. There are multiple solutions. Half run, border control, gatekeeper, pharaohs. Uh, some of those work, but some of them don't. And then some of them are just really bad. Like, there's cards that are good against them. They're generally the stuff with a bit higher strength, but, like, you can't play a deck that's three pharaohs. It's like you don't have a deck anymore. You're probably just better off going faster, right? Like, you just go faster. I don't think you want to, like, play three pharaohs in your deck. Okay, anyways, um, we got to win. We have mana, Magar, mana, Wedic. Like, are we complaining? Maybe we shouldn't. We have a double install here? No, we don't. We can draw once for ice. I'm kidding. We can't afford ice. Why did we do that? That was really bad. So we'll do server one. Okay. Gain two credits. If they trash this, I think we're okay with it. Pharaohs with 10 strength is pretty good. Triple advancing a Pharaohs in a fast meta is like the one of the worst things you can do. And then it's going to get like hippoed or someone's going to boomerang it or botulus it. Like, Pharos is not the answer to anyone's problems. And if that was, like, why are we doing that? We can just play, like, Ag Infusion. Like, play Anansi, Chiashi, and all the stuff that, like, does scale well out of it. Yeah, I don't know. Faster Horizontal, I feel like that's been the formula to be Runner Doom Rigs. Uh, there was a good while, right? Like, the PD decks used to be a competitive deck, and it was the mid-range between, like, mid-range combo and rush. And, like, to some decks, it was too fast for them to deal with. But, you know, it kind of gets there. We have a lot of agendas in hand. Just like against Endurance, upgrades will gain more prevalence. Yeah, but upgrades are harder to play now. Obviously, upgrades are good. They're actually taxing people out more than the Ravana does, considering they're going to break that for one credit. Um, but I'm raising a Sherlock just to see what happens. But like all that sort of stuff, you know, people are playing three pinhole in every deck. So it's it's really hard. It's really, really hard. Like you notice that the Anawag decks didn't exist at Worlds. They, they didn't, people didn't play it because it doesn't make that much sense. Manogram is still good. It's a fire all. Okay, cool. All right. They can't trace both of them. Do you want to work? Sherlock, six strength. All right. They don't even have a decoder though. Like even a drafter here might've been a nightmare. So they boosted that one. So here, add install program to the bottom of the runner stack. Uh, we solved it. We figured out how to beat the turbine meta. The turbine meta has been solved. You're welcome. Pinhole are finite? Yeah, but so is the, the, the time of the game. War I'd provide a good counter for Pinhole. So, like, a lot of the options, like, War I'd is slow. It's not a tempo play. It only generally shows up in prison decks because it's just, like, an economic disadvantage card, right? So if you're not going fast, it doesn't really matter. So, like, getting all that stuff together and playing even slower, you're going to end up on the other extreme. Like, again, we're agreeing that either you go fast enough to beat it or so, so slow, and I even think then you don't beat it because runner economy is a pretty good, right? Yeah, Anoetic is like kind of expensive. Speaking of kind of expensive, uh, we can score this out and still do things. That's actually kind of sick. That was the best Sherlock in like of all time. Okay, we still have a turn here. We don't have a lot of money. But we have econ cards. So we can get. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I know. The Sherlock actually did something, which is kind of cool. Like these subroutines are fine. Um, we paid a lot for that, though. Okay, so I do think we have to get a refuge in there. I think we have to get the Rashida in here, and then I think we click for a credit. Do we install something over it? No, like, this is a break for one credit eventually. This is a break for one credit. Like, the fact our ice gets broken for one credit, I don't know. I don't like it. I, can't, I don't think we can afford the deeper install. Something like that. I just got hit by an upgrade that tags you for pinholing stuff in the server. Don't remember the name. Yeah, that's a, oh man, it's a Wayland one. This is if you trash something in the server, uh, you gain a tag. It's a niche card. It's the one with like a C mine on it, but it shows up as like a way to deal with, uh, uh, what's it called? To deal with Apocalypse and Horizontal decks. Pretty good. No, not Worry Tracker. It's a Wayland one. If they trash this with like Miss Bones, I think we're pretty happy. So Prague is down. Rig Shooter is a good counter for K2CP. Keegan stacks that out. In standard Diogene, I would not play Rig Shooter. Like, all the Anarchs are bringing their breakers back. The Shapers can still play Simul Chip, and I think they should. I don't think in startup, yeah. It's in standard, I don't know. Rig Shooter hasn't been good for years. All right, we'll gain three. 
Nice. Okay, cool. The other card in server two is a Tranquid, right? Yeah, uh, no, it's a, a Mana Garm. They trashed our Tranquid uh, a while ago, unfortunately. But yeah, I wish. That would have been good. I do think we have a chance here. We have to score out a food again. We're in a really ugly spot. I think we need the money from Offworld. So again, unfortunately, all our ice is just pennies for them. But it does eat boomerangs, though, which is nice. And we know that the card they want is on the bottom of the deck. And so they can shuffle with like a boomerang. So we'll put this in server one. We'll get this in front of it. We'll gain two. And we'll advance. I think even if they run this. So we have to advance this once. Again, we're not running seamless. And I think we can easily throw out the magnet. So we have to throw out two if they get through the anoetic. We're expecting more pinholes, though. Sorry, I don't know the name of the card. I was hoping someone in chat did. Um, but it, it started showing up in a bunch of the uh, like Bridgman type op decks. And it's like a niche card that played in like Gagarin. But it's okay. It's okay. It's uses less for us for protecting stuff. I think price tag is like underexplored. And I think single tag actually got a fair bit better. Uh, considering people are not playing no free lunch. Like I just want to put a price tag on the table on like CTM. Turn one, someone runs it. Yeah, that's it, Dana. Overseer. Thank you. It's Overseer Matrix. Huge. So that's a Nuka. Draw three again. They have 15 cards. They can shuffle their deck as much as their thing is on the bottom. HQ is pretty good. I wonder if they're on Revolver or whether they're on just McGulter. And what is... <laughs> there's just a drafter here. Like, our game hasn't been about R&D. And hey, we're going to get two credits a turn from Refuge Campaign. This is actually like mid-range is kind of doing something. Uh, pinhole. All right. Uh, so they're going to take down this upgrade. Or maybe the Mana Garm, if they're expecting it. Which they well they know it. I don't know if they just use it to deal with the refuge campaign. It'd be pretty funny as much as they can use the Chesba credits. So let's see what they access. They get two cards off bankroll and they can trash for free with Chesba. Like this is so good. It's anoetic shit. Okay, we have another one. But with two clicks left, it's possible for them to run this. This is high strength though, and they don't have a decoder yet. So like there's a couple options we're presenting or problems we're presenting. So this server seem is pretty good. Hey, Cody, how's it going? What's the stream? Build a PD? Yeah, we're trying to like re recreate the sort of like slow value in time mid-range ice of like 2015 world's winning Netrunner. They like engineering the future sort of list. And it is, you know, we've we've seen Turbine in every single deck uh, tonight. Let's just say that. Okay. So we have to score that. I don't know what their multi-axis is. Uh, they have... Sometimes you can play, like, what's it called in this deck? Um, Hushik. They could be on it. They're hitting Poison Vial on our turn. Poison Vial and Byroids is a really bad combination for us. I think we get rid of an Eli. Hey, Nana Civic can, 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 Nana Civic Grid can kill Turbine pretty easily. Might be a move if Turbine gets out of control. Oh, Vincent. Sorry, they banned it. Did no one tell you? Oh, no. You know, they <laughs> no, they banned that one. I think you just go faster. For whatever it's worth. All right, the boomerang is Sherlock, and so they can do boomerang and poison vial. The thing about ads and like the boomerang builds is like once they get to the bottom of the stack, uh, it starts recurring, right? Like it becomes infinite because every click, like clicklessly, they can always install a boomerang. Now they have twelve cards left. Or they'll be thirteen once this goes back. So this is still something. Like it's a boomerang in this. Uh, this thing is what three credits? I'll take it. I'm behind. Yeah, yeah. They banned it. They banned it. Uh, they banned two corp cards, two runner cards. So this version is like not very impactful. For them, I think it was technically credit positive, especially because of the cleavers. For us, going to 18 to 13, yeah, you, it's fine. So you have to find out this way. I know, I know. Did they turbine for, did they trash it? No, yo, Macaroni, we hit them with a Sherlock and it fired. They beat one trace, but the other trace they didn't. So here we have to res a draft. Yo, is this drafter going to fire? They can Gabali it, but like that's kind of sick, especially if Drafter fires our Asa ability triggers. But they haven't found a killer yet, so we can add a card from Archives to HQ. Oh, never mind. Oh, that interaction is kind of sick. It's so weird to do a backwards and then forwards. So they broke the last subroutine and then poisoned about the first subroutine. D to me, super unintuitive that you can't do it. You think you'd break from top down, but that's so wild. So again, HQ matters, and they're going to be able to run HQ cheaply, as much as Sherlock is, you know, kind of a, a beefy boy. I like the art on the Sherlock a fair bit. I think more Byroid should play instruments. Street Magic? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, but street magic, you range them, right? Like that seems like well, it was kind of par for the course. Okay, so we can do install advance. I think we have to score out enough agendas. The problem now is like we're weak to HQ, so we have to ice that up. Uh, the turbine is in 12. They just shuffled, so it's anywhere in the 12. It's no longer in the bottom. So we can do install these two clicklessly. Pinhole threadings, we're at two down. One down. Uh oh, one down. That's not good. Uh, we have Sherlock now, maybe Archangel. Yeah, maybe Archangel, but then like maybe for Shaper, that's okay. You can still trace into it. Like that's the thing is Archangel, there's always a ceiling on it because you can always trace into it if it's ever more expensive than breaking. Uh, but like then you still get Botulist, I reckon, if you're playing against Anarch. Planning your turn for the Sasa has been kind of fun, though. This actually does feel like food codes, as much as this is like an interesting matchup, and they just haven't jammed Turbine and got all their breakers down. So we can do server one, install, install, advance, and then we could subsidy. It keeps us three cards in hand. That's probably fine. Oh, we get a card off of this or two credits. I think we want the card. Because we just need to have uh, cards in hand to, to feed uh, the Anoetic. So we'll advance once. Oh, don't res that. Oh, my. Uh, and then we'll just subsidy. This feels like what we set out to do. I'll be honest. Too bad you don't have GFI. Yeah, if we had GFI, like it, this is again really ugly. And I think back in the day with Spin Doctor or uh, what's it called, Jackson, you could actually spend more turns drawing because it was actually really important that you got your global foods. I think scoring three agendas out is like four agendas out, mind you, is like one of the worst things we can do here. I'm actually hoping that they get in here somehow. At least they might trash this and we only have one recursion piece. Again, the old deck had archive memories and ways to bring back your defensive pieces. And I do think like uh, restore seems really good. If you're trying to score out on a remote server with like an anoetic void or like a mana garm and they're pinholing you, you can just recur it. And I think you have to. Their MU is also filled up. So if they ever want to get another breaker down, they have to trash their bankrolls, which is fine. Yeah, but I think scoring four agendas is going to be hard. You could also like play a single biotic and then just cheese out the last Vitruvius. I think that's also a very reasonable thing so that when you get to three, it's not super awkward. Notably, the Shaper deck of the week is not playing Clot. So if you're playing against a Smoke deck, you can just try. Just force fast advance if you need to. This feels OK. Uh, this is this is OK. Would adding an FA finisher be against the mid-range team? No. A bunch of the ETF decks that had a single biotic. So you understood. It, they're generally the ones that were running like three accelerated beta tests, which was all of them, or later three Vitruvius ones. So like we're only running, actually, we do have three three twos because I think we're playing two Vitruvius and one Luminal. Are we only on one Vitruvius? I'm not sure. But yeah, no, I think a single biotic would be very, very reasonable. We already had a 54 card deck though, so we had problems. So now we have three three twos. I think it would be fine. Second threading. All right, well, hey, influence. <laughs> If we iced up archives, I think that would have been okay. I just don't think we had time to as much as we are. Yeah, maybe we should just play slower. Like, maybe this is on us. Maybe we should just, like, triple ice everything and just click for credits a bit more. Because the free archives run. Okay, wow. Wait, how are they going to... Oh, because of bankroll. Okay, so we just have to th throw the whole bus at them. Because I don't know if they're going to be able to deal with the Fairchild. They need to get a trick. But they need a trick for the Ravana. So if they have a trick for the Ravana, they probably don't have a trick for the Fairchild, right? And merely we res this for seven, but I don't think we care. <laughs> Brent, how's it going? Oh my god, the grid. Who's this us all of a sudden? I generally say us or we when we play. You don't have to be part of it. You can imagine it's everyone besides you. Uh, but I always have said us or we. Some people think it's weird. I get it. But it'll be everyone but you if, you, <laughs> if it's a problem. Don't worry. So let's see what they do here. This is already kind of expensive for them, right? Like this is three credits because they don't have it. I don't think they can make this, Kalana. Yeah, I think you're right. Back for another game. My kid turns 12 today, so I missed the earlier stream stuff. Hold on. Wait, I have a button for this. And I have never used it. You ready? Hold on. This should work. Okay, it's working. Okay, let's go. Oh, we just score out. This is a happy birthday song. It's probably much louder than me. Okay. Five cards. We get to install one of these. So, Food and Nico Magnet. 
Do we have to reveal it? I don't think we have to reveal it. Happy birthday. Which of us, with us the closest things we have to Twitch players exactly. Okay, so here we get to install a card. We can install the global, global food initiative. I feel like that's a bit not good. Um, all these are pretty bad though. The magnet is like kind of the best case until they get their bus out down. If it's an agenda, you have to show it to prove it. You can't res. Oh, that's actually true, right? Because you may install and res. Those are two. That's one clause. Okay, this is actually difficult. And the thing is, like, if we install an ice, we can't install an agenda. Because with the asset clause, the second card can never be an agenda uh, for balance reasons, I reckon. So we can install the spin doctor. Also, do these cards get shuffled back? No. So we're going to know the order. Which card's the top card? The magnet? I think the magnet's the top card. So we know that four down will be fine here. This is actually really difficult. Um, so I think we're trying to score the off world next turn. We do install advance. So we basically want to set up for that. So I think we just do the Nico campaign. And then we can get like, I don't know. We can also just get the magnet on archives. That actually probably is fine. Yeah, I think that's fine. Ah, uh, I don't know if that was the best option. Install food and force the run. I think you're right. Install food is force the run is okay. But if they get through our mana arm, like how do we score next turn? So kind of a mixed bag. Cause again, it's not only can they get the food, which they can, um, they don't have to cause they'll know it's a food. I think this is totally fine, right? Like how much does this cost them? Kind of like install spin, use Tranky to draw, discard the food. Yeah, install spin doctor is really nice. It's our last spin doctor though. But install spin could have been credit positive. The fact that we didn't get tranquility value is like the worst part of this. So they spent two clicks and a, a vile credit. Okay, that's fine. And this is uh, three credits. So like there's, yeah, it's okay. It's definitely not bad, but it's very easy to do like inefficient diversion funds. Like they got, they have more money than we think because they have, mind you, 14 on bankrolls, but like we're still economically fine. Okay. So I think we have to jam in here. Can they deal with a tier? They click through one of them. Like, I think we have a cool line here where we force them to click through one part of the tier. Admittedly, though, if they like boomerang the tier, it's an absolute nightmare. So we don't want to do that because they can just boomerang this and then like poison violet. Uh, so we know the food is like two down, I think. I think it's two down. It's spin doctor and then food. So if we install this. Uh, I don't know how to play this out. I feel like this is going to be the hardest point because I think we need the spin doctor to bring back the Anoetics. So I think we draw once for the spin. I think we get the spin on server one. This is not worth it. I don't think we'll res this. I think we just hit this. And then they have to kind of consider running this and we still get value. How much refuge profit have we made? It's kind of hard to tell. Um, let's see. Because it's gonna if I control F refuge, uh, it'll be a while. But this one's probably a four credit card, at least maybe six credits. But like how much money do we do we commit to this server? Okay, the Bugalter's here. All right, this is good. Why not try to get the tier down? Because they'll break it with boomerang and poison vial for free. And we can't spend 10 credits for that. It's like this combination is really, really, really bad into tier they can also click through it once and then play poison vial which would be okay uh but like the fact that they have boomerang and poison vial means we cannot like tax them out with big eyes yeah and then us paying 10 would be an issue i reckon like this is taxing them for three this will tax them for more wait how are they going to deal with this for fairchild Wait, are they, wait, they're not. We're going to pay seven for this. Are they going to actually pay for the Fairchild? They can save credits by like trashing their poison vials, let alone using their poison vials. But like, this seems like it's expensive. That's like seven to break. They could break it for, I think, five and poison. But then they still need like tranquility. So yeah, they have to crack their bankroll. That's good. At least that slowed down that part of their economy. But now they know what the remote server is. So here they can like intelligently, um, what's it called? Uh, boomerang. The, the fact that they ran HQ and got the wake and plan charge, I think that's the biggest part of it. So yeah, they're going to break. Force the trash. Wait, they could have just used this to break two subroutines. Oh, they did. They did. I'm oh, sorry. I thought they trashed it. Okay. So here we're going to res this because we have to do it now. 
they got a banker off the top. We have a food in hand, which is good. Oh, my foot's asleep. Oh, my foot's really asleep. Um, I, we have to shuffle back here. And now we have what we call a scoring window. So I think we just put two anoetics back. And hopefully they went a bit too deep here. Now the issue though is that we left the spin doctor is that they don't have to pay for the mana garm. I think they want to though, but it might be right not to pay for the mana garm here. I think if they pay for the mana garm here, yeah, we actually probably should have left the spin doctor. Because here they can not play for the mana garm, and I think forcing them to pay for the mana garm is the most important thing we could do that turn. That actually might have been a substantial mistake. Yeah, fuck. Excuse me. That was a, definitely a misplay. Yeah, we should have let the spin doctor go. Okay, at least here, this is one of the best, like, on tempo things you can put in the remote server. Yeah. Yeah, we might get some, see some HQ pressure here. I still think it's expensive. They have 10 cards, only one in hand, probably a boomerang. Okay, so what's our play? What is our play? So we definitely want to get the Vitruvius in the remote server. We don't have a biotic. And if they hit that one, it's the, the least expensive one for us to lose. We could also actually go off-world office, install advance, and then force them to the server. If we had another thing to put in the server, I think that would be the best case scenario. Uh, I do think we could consider install advance. Vitruvius tier, hedge credit. I don't think we can afford the tier. If we res the tier for tier and they boomerang it and then poison violate, like we lose the game, I think. Maybe not, but like it's a it's a three credit install, and then we res for ten. Draw for void. I think we'd rather just install advance, force them to jam, and then next turn push out the Vitruvius, and eventually we'll just naturally draw the void. The question is whether we want to get another install here for three credits. I think we can afford it. Yeah. Oh, we also could have like drawn for the what's it called there, the um. Excuse me. We could have drawn for the. Uh, wow, the Anoetic. Vitru, Eli, Hedge Credit. Yeah, that's what we did, except we went for Advance, and we didn't do the Vitruvius. Yeah, this is the thing. Like, now they're going to, they're at the point where they constantly boomerang. So again, having a big ice that we rest for 10, they break for, for free. So yeah, you generally don't want to do it. This HQ pressure is actually very reasonable, because they want to lock R&D. But if they don't run this, they obviously lose. So this is interesting. Okay, the last poison vial on this. So from this point on, it's going to be a bit tricky to break. Oh, they can click, or they can trace, or they can take a tag. A lot of options here. <laughs> this card is very interesting. None of these things are... Uh, it's, it's fine, it's fine. And now they break this for one credit. That's a problem. But this is actually one of the best dice we could imagine having on HQ, which is kind of sick. Okay, this is a single access. Obviously, if they hit an agenda, that's fine. Nico, they can trash for free. They're not. I think they should, so they get better accesses here. But now they can run R&D in 3-3. How many agendas are there in R&D? Honestly, not that many. But the Begalta run is going to be next to free uh, with the bankroll, and then they might try and lock R&D. But here they have this to deal with. This is interesting. They haven't seen NGO fronts. I think you'd assume there's NGO fronts. I do feel like this, uh, this refuge campaign has entirely kept our economy afloat. This is pretty wild. This is actually a pretty wild game. Their deck is cool. I want to play more of this. As is great. Refuge campaign MVP is silently a card so underwhelming that people forget it's there. And then secretly, it could be like a six credit econ card over over like eight turns. It's fine. Sherlock Bottom's MVP tail. Yeah, the tag on this is like kind of relevant. It doesn't really matter. Like, they can go tag me now. They don't need resources. They're not playing the back, I think. But this is good. I wonder if we earned more from it than we spent on ice protecting it. At this point, probably not. But admittedly, the ice actually ended up protecting other stuff. And they know if they trash this, we put something else into it. So yeah, yeah, and, and no. But yeah, probably not. <laughs> but that being said, like, this was a good server before. And we jammed an agenda in it. Like, their only Vitruvius was here. Refuge campaign is just caddy for corpse. Well, that's clickless. Oh, they're going back. I think they're giving up on their mode server. I think they might just see three on R&D. But yeah, this is where they get the infinite engine, right? Like, again, the tier, I don't know if it'll work out. So boomerang here, they'll take a tag. They could poison if they really wanted to. I don't think they're worried about the, 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 the tag there. The only real way that they can trash for a reasonable cost of pinhole, you don't want to waste pinholes on it. Yeah, exactly. At this point, it's pinhole or nothing, and they're not going to pinhole that. If only we had Breaker Bay. Yeah, James, tell me about it, eh? That's our tranquility is our breaker bay. All right. They got the Vitruvius. That's huge. That's our last three, too. 
So now they're going to try and win off the Waken plant. They're not mad dashing. So for them to win, they need to steal two more agendas. We have nine agendas in the deck. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So there's only two agendas in R&D. They need to steal both of them by seeing four cards off of R&D. So they have to steal every single agenda in R&D. Otherwise, we win. So we got this far. And at this point, you know, it's fate. It's all fate. Because they have to steal both agendas. We good. Oh, never mind. Oh, we're good. Not even close. Barely close. I thought they were only seeing two cards for a second. That after the first one, I was like, we're fine. But yeah, that's it. Good game. I think if they trashed the Nico in hand, it might have mattered. They only ran back once, so they got a uh, game there. Thanks for the game. So look at that. Runner gained 109 credits. Again, a lot of that stuff is like clicklessly running, getting the econ engine off of Tranquility, like your deck. Uh, for us, we got 121 credits, but we did play this the way that we thought we'd play it. I do think we did not Sherlock away the, uh, what's it called? The uh, turbine. We'd actually had a huge nightmare problem. That would have been a problem for sure. Turn 17 more than mid range. I think turn 17 is kind of reasonable for those uh, ETF decks. Like this is the, I think we got really lucky that this is probably the best kind of example of what this deck looked like, right? Like kind of slow. It sets up. Then you saw, admittedly, they're breaking things for like absurdly cheap that you wouldn't exactly have seen back in the day, but they had to make good decisions on when to run and when to get their multi axis. So it was all about setting up stuff. Like, okay, it's been a couple turns. I'm going to run HQ to get a wake in plan charge, let alone, uh, you know, get an axis there. And they have to figure out where the agendas are. They contested the remote server. They contested our upgrades. They flushed remote servers when there was economic, economic and assets in them, let alone upgrades. Like, that was good. <laughs> the proudest Sherlock has ever been oh yeah this ice all falls apart to turbine it doesn't all ice yeah 17 is still pretty mid though to be h mid late yeah it's mid late but i i think that etf food codes like was doing that pretty consistently but it was not unlikely to see a uh, that game where there's like again six points here eight points here and again if it's not obvious this is the strength of global food initiative where they have to steal four agendas left like they literally have to get one two three four five six seven wait there's three agendas in here oh i did my no yeah they literally had to steal every single agenda to win they had to steal every single other agenda in the game uh, obviously the remote server that so oh wait one two three four five six seven oh because there's one in hand of course surveyor with the weed ginger grid doesn't oh sure but then you just boomerang that. Or you just trace it. Like, I don't know. I don't think Surveyor is real. Like, Surveyor doesn't become good until it's really deep on a server. It's trace, like, what, six? You can always break that if you want. You can trace through it. But, like, you just boomerang this, don't you? Mad Dash is an option. Are people still on a copy of it? They should be. Every deck should be. Again, tune in on Monday. We'll have a video talking about it. But every deck should be. I ran some statistic maths for programs and turns out Wake and Plant literally turns agendas into non-point cards. You would not imagine how many ice you access with Wake. <laughs> yeah, it's good though. Like you get so many additional accesses with this. Like it makes your HQ runs better. Wake's a good card. <laughs> All right. I'm actually surprised that we got a good example of what that deck should look like. And we played it kind of like that. It's currently 1140. We don't have the time for another game. If I'll, I'll hang out for a bit uh, uh, before we sign off. If there's any like questions or anything, we can go through that. But yeah, the math on the agenda stuff is going to be really interesting. And I'm going to record a, a video this week. I think the other thing that I wanted considering doing, and I, I don't know how, again, how unreasonable this is. But I think there's a claim right now, right? That like Anarchs have so much money in the standard format. And now with, you know, not having to play no free lunch in theory and having not two endurances in your deck, you have like 12 influence to play with. Can you just play this? What's it called? Like, does Anarch have enough money that this is the way that you deal with Anansi? I don't, I don't know. I'm like considering it. Like those Anarch decks, the way that you build them in the most uninteresting way, have so much economy in them that like playing two copies of Rubicon Switch doesn't seem like a huge cost. And if they ever res a big thing that you struggle to break with your like bin breakers, you can just maybe de-res it. Now, as soon as you like dive into that, I think you figure out that you want to play a deck that has some sort of economic pressure on the corporation. Otherwise, they might just be comfortable re-resing your stuff. And I don't think we want to go out of the way to play Reyna uh, because that ability is probably not that great. I don't know. I, I think this is actually kind of interesting. And if people think runner economy has kind of got away, um, this is one of the best ways to like leverage runner economy into something that's like pretty oppressive for corps who do have a limited economy comparatively. Pretty hard to keep paying though. Not sure if it's good if you target a Nancy only. 
I think you can target certain things, right? Like even like derezzing a hog in for four credits, that's kind of expensive. Emergency shutdown, yeah, I, I don't like I think you could consider playing this as a card without building into it that difficult. Like that that hard is what I'm trying to think. Like I think if you really want to do a Rubicon switch deck, you play 419, who's a huge economic pressure. You play criminal. There's a bunch of stuff you can play, like shutdown. In Anarch, you can play this, you can play like uh, en passant, uh, you can play Xanadu, you can play Reyna. Like, there's economic denial cards. You just search anything that has the word res in it and, and standard on the runner side, you generally get there. Um, but I'm wondering if this is just like good enough as a slot. Brute Force hack, yeah. No, actually, that one's banned. Uh, it's It rotated, I think. Yeah, it's in terminal directives. You can play exploit, though. So, hey, just as good, if not better. Kid here looks like he's like 12 and in a 10 10 comic. Yeah, Rubicon and place a turbine, right? Like, that's the idea. And admittedly, like maybe Turbine is better because you're breaking everything for cheaply. And if you're breaking everything for cheaply, why do you need to derez it? But I think if there's a claim that like runners have more money than they have things to do with it, like why not? What's enough money? Because Num Hush can be anti Anansi. Num Hush is not anti Anansi. Okay, wait, Num? But this is the idea, right? Like how much are we bringing for Anansi with Num? You install it for four, you break Anansi for six. Or you derez it once for eight. And then hopefully they never res it again. Admittedly, you face check into it. That's actually probably an issue. But you know what I mean, right? Like, it's still kind of hard. I don't know. I, I feel like you're more likely to not play Numb, especially if you're playing um, Turbine, right? Like, you don't need to play Numb. Hush, you need to pay two. So the idea with Hush is you don't have to break all the text, right? All the all the ice. um, All the subroutines, excuse me. So you have to get this down, right? Your MU is already a bit, gets crowded. And then which subroutine do you not break? Probably to do a net damage. Yeah, that's fair. It's probably fair. Wait, wait, what do you mean you only have to pay two? Oh, because you're letting these subroutines fire? Because you're not. Br I don't think you want to. How should the game changer for Nam and Nancy? These subroutines are really good. Like the top subroutine is messed up good. The middle subroutine is okay. The bottom subroutine is whatever. Obviously, the text is more important. But I think, yeah, breaking this for two is fine. But then you have to break the top one, right? Numb is one of the worst breakers ever printed. It's far from that. It's comically bad. No, 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 it's not. Uh, what is the one that is uh with the... There's so many worse killers, even in Anarch, than Numb. Yeah, the top one's the, the one you want to break. Numb is for Vile, though. Yeah, but nobody's, like, playing that. But Vile, Numb work well together. I think you're more likely to see that in Startup than in Standard. Because in Startup, like, Anarchs just can't break high-strength sentries. Uh, what is the worst... What is that one that's, like, NFR, but for sentries? It has like a kind of a ninja character on it. It's from this era. It's it's no, there's really, really bad centuries. I'm Kaldra. Pufferfish, Flashbang. I'm always interested to play Flashbang because I think Flashbang does do something unique. So it's kind of interesting. It's obviously way too expensive. So you have to interface, mind you, with this. MK Ultra is fine. But do you anyone know what this one is? It's like a really ugly one. Hold on, we can find it. Zed standard. Uh, K is K for subtype. It's probably this killer. Uh, Anarch. A credit install is unintendable for what? Yeah, Sunya. That's it. Thank you. This is a bad one. Like this is Sunya. I've never seen a C play, but it has the same text as Nefer, which says whenever you fully break a piece of ice, you get a power counter in here, and its strength goes up for power counters. Which like one strength is already really bad. You're gonna need support. And mind you, this was meant to be played, I reckon, with null, so you can break three strength sentries. But then still, this text is so awful, like so unimaginably bad. And specifically, specifically from back at this point, sentries were kind of known as the one type of ice that has the most amount of subroutines. It was the sort of thing like you would see sentries with like four or five subroutines pretty consistently in the standard format back then. It's not exactly still the case, but still like this is kind of weird. Yeah, yeah, I think Numb is fine. It's your hour. How's it going? I always go back to the birds for bad break ratios. Yeah, <laughs> the birds like they have support. I just searched bird. That's not going to work, but yeah. Yeah, tour guide, exactly. Like tour guide, there was Kamainu back in the day. Even Sarugi, I think, still was legal. There's a lot of cards with sentries that have a lot of subroutines on them. Um, so that was pretty bad. Do you install different? I agree, Sunny to be as bad as Num. No, Num is four credits. Like it's fine. It's, it's one more than than Sunya. Like you this you put down, and then you don't worry about the text. You only use it in a panic and then you poison violet. Sunya, you have to put half your deck to make this work. I think if there's any century, we definitely should be playing three of. It's Persephone. Two credits for one century subroutine, one strength, we're already stoked. But then, yeah, the text on this is really fun. 
I played Noom and Palangi Freedom in the Circuit Breaker Championship and it was surprisingly okay. Yo, people don't play Palangi anymore and I think Palangi is like way better than it looks. I think Palangi got killed alongside the ubiquity of Cyberdeck Sandbox, but like we've kind of sailed past that. Obviously, it's been banned for a while. And Mavirus is still like somewhat popular, but I do think Palangi is pretty good. The issue is that like Palangi didn't really matter when people had endurance. But there's like a whole bunch of cards like this that just stopped seeing play, and then it's going to take a while for people to go back to them. But like Palangi is just kind of really powerful. Um, Paperclip is still sees play. There's good breakers out there. I, I just think maybe there's a chance that this is not necessary when you can just play Buzzsaw and play down your uh, turbine. I thought it was eight credit install trunk for Sunya. Oh no, no, Sunya's cheap. Bankar, Persephone, Palangi went. Yeah, Doom Rat, how's it going? Yo, I played the, your deck list of the week. I was so surprised how little stealth is in there. And I could not break an Odoroshi, but that's kind of on me. Um, but congrats. That's really fun. I like your decks. Yeah, Orca's the big whale at eight. I think I saw this recently. Somebody played uh Barem Wu's that sort of like Banhar Apex deck that uh we did a video on it uh I think last year. And it was playing Orca because it didn't have to pay credits for Orca because they were playing Apex and then they flipped Orca face up with Assimilator. So you just install it for free as much as you have to run through the hoops of Assimilator, which you were doing anyway. But like, I think that's probably one of the best cases of Orca is that this allows you to deal with the big sentries and you're installing it for cheap. Persephone Plongi is a Nambo. Hold on. I don't even remember the text on Persephone. I think Persephone also doesn't, it works. You don't have to break. Yeah. Yeah, you don't need Plongi for this. No, you, wait. Because Palangi loses the subtype when it passes the ice. I think you want e grid, right? Choose an ice for the remainder of the encounter. And this triggers, sorry if I exit that fast, after encountering it. Yeah, so when you pass it, it's no longer sentry. So yeah, you need e grid. And then the idea is that you can just smash into, and mind you, Persephone is not unique. You can just smash into things with Banhar. I think there is a video somewhere on this channel that's probably not labeled well enough that you can find it, in which we played a triple Persephone deck. And it was like right in the point of the meta where people were playing like, Three Mouseless was in everything, so you would egret a Mouseless and let the subroutines fire because you didn't care, and then you'd mill three cards or whatever. And then also back in the day, there was a uh, slot machine was super ubiquitous, so the slot machine had three subroutines that weren't relevant. You would egret this and run through it, and it was really really fun. Yeah, Thanos, you know as well. Yeah, there's like a weird meta where there's so much ice that had so many subroutines that you you could let fire if you wanted to if you were like really really into the Persephone engine. As much as this is obviously quite bad. Yeah, it was a hype stream. Oh, you remember it. Oh, that's sick. That's really, really cool. Yeah. Um, that was my friend uh, Wass's deck. Originally, he was playing a lot of it. He's the guy who put together Keyhole. Hey, Cody, best meta deck of all time. Tyler Durden before zero CV. It's so wild. I keep looking up the Durden deck. Hold on. I think we can do it. Uh, is it ND? Um, cause this name and this deck came up into multiple iterations. We played one on the stream. I know Cody, you played one. And then there's other versions that weren't named that, that were like other options of the self damage uh there were Alice decks for some reason at the time uh but these are really really fun and this was before even it was playable before zero clan vengeance this is actually after clan vengeance but sorry after clan vengeance before zero i'm not sure how old the one that we played on the channel was yeah clan vengeance was around but these decks were really fun speak of fisk investment seminar this sort of archetype was really really cool yeah i don't know my fave deck it was really a really fun deck even before zero if you haven't seen this and you know listen to to old folks reminisce about old net running the idea with this deck was is that there was a cycle of cards um that were kind of about self damage the most powerful one by a mile is this one that's currently banned that says whenever you suffer any amount of damage you get a power counter here and then at instant dang speed you can trash a card from hq at random for each power counter on here so the idea is that if you got five power counters here on your turn run archives they have to trash your whole hand, let alone the fact that this was at instant speed means that at any point in time, you can interrupt a, a combo from the corporation. So if they public trail you, you just say sorry, and then you just wipe their hand. So you know they're not going to hit you with end of line. You hit, get hit by one end of the line, you say, no, sorry, and you trash your whole hand. It was so fun and so wild. And then you'd go out of your way to basically play all the cards that could hurt you just to power up this engine. And you're playing Alice so you could run archives. But like you would mad dash like archives without agendas in them. Like you just do whatever you wanted to get hurt. Uh, we're playing all these like really strange cards. Like Officer Frank, yeah, allows you to trash cards. This was a card you could play at one point in time. And then you had Hades Shard to access everything from archives. It was so fun. Zero Vengeance meta was a wild time. Doom Rat, I remember recording a regionals from that and I don't think that recordings went anywhere because I did not spend the, like dozens of hours editing it together years ago because it was so bad to watch. It was like, Corpse couldn't do anything. It was just like you jam out before you lose your hand. Because if you don't jam your hand, you lose your hand. And then you just absolutely get ruined. 
would like to see a Sangren style record reconstructed on this one. This deck was never immensely powerful. That there's a lot of people that never saw this archetype. This was just kind of like a favorite from a lot of people. This did catch on really, really hard when Zero got printed. Because Zero, if you don't know, it's legal right now in standard. Uh, is a card that allows you to just spend a click to tempo positively take damage. And so then every Anarch deck was running the good stuff Anarch, kind of like now, but running three zero three kind Vengeance. Some were running two clan Vengeance. But yeah, I don't know. These are really fun. It's just like, it's hard to play this in Eternal because this is not a strong enough archetype. So you kind of have to like set your expectations. I think it was intended to battle kill cards a bit back in Flashpoint. Rather than just slotting anti-damage stuff, they could sit around to stop it. But then like you could just keep doing it over and over again. Yeah, it was easy to like... I don't think you recurred this ever, but like you had three of them and they were not unique. So you could install three of them and just pop one when you needed to while loading all of it at the same time. It was pretty wild. And then, of course, this was a really important card back then because you could choose what damage you lost from hand. So that was good. Bug meta. <laughs> Man, this is fun. If Climb Dungeons was a click and trash cost, it would be better. It would be much more fair. I still think it probably would be a bit too good. Um, I don't know. I think maybe after you clicked it, you had to take a tag or something. Maybe that's not interesting. Like maybe that doesn't change the card fundamentally. Uh, but yeah, the fact that this was instant speed was also makes the game really awkward because then there's actually a very reasonable, uh, interaction at every single paid ability window in a lot of instances. And I think the game is better without that. Played original where the sick deck slotted a bug to see what they were drawing into. So, you know, when to fire them. Bug used to be like one of the big meme cards um, that everyone wanted an excuse to play this. You pay two credits on the corp to a card, see it. Technically, with infinite information, you're the most powerful runner. However, that's very expensive. Uh, what's his name? Ian? What was the name of the spook? I think it's Ian. Ian something. But yeah, man, this card's really funny. Art's good. Is this a Liga? Yeah, it's a Liga for sure. 46th card syndrome. That is generous. <laughs> All right, I think that's going to be it for the stream. Uh, we'll have a video up on Monday. I've been doing some coding. Excited to see the results. Uh, again, we're going to be announcing a GNK that should be free for anyone to open. It'll be in probably the two weekends from now. We'll have a date locked down by next Thursday. Again, if you're applying for regionals or sorry, for nationals, the window closes this weekend. So get your applications in. And again, uh, Null Signal Games is running a free tournament online on the 25th. You can find more notes on Null Signal Games. Ian Sterling. Oh, thank you. Of course, Sterling, like Archer. That's really great. Uh, but that's all. Take care of yourself. We'll be back in a bit. Hopefully you're doing well.